it was just a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, it was um, it was inspiring, and it was yeah. like it was like drinking water, you know, after you've been on a, been on a long hike, and you're very <laughs> tired and you're very dry. And uh, his words were like, well, they were like, yeah, gold and drops of, yeah. Gold. He's always positive in his approach. He's mm. um, his uh, doctoral degree was on uh, is on uh, happiness psychology. Oh wow! Um, yes. Well, I could certainly do with some of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. uh, he said he will uh, send his uh, presentation across so that I can share it with you. Even we were talking yesterday about that. Oh, that would be wonderful! Um, wonderful. Um, so yeah. I, I think it's 9.31, so I think we will get started and we have a lot sure. of participants also. So sure. I'll just uh, close my audio uh, video and uh, get back. Yeah. Josephine? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, Dr. Josephine yes, will be our uh, anchor. Yes, Josephine, is everything ready? Yes, ma'am. Can we start then? Is the prayer ready? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So over to Dr. Josephine who will be the anchor for today. Yes, just take over. Yes, ma'am. Respected learner delegates from across the continents, guests and participants, a very good morning to one and all. I feel privileged to welcome you all on behalf of the organizing committee to the final day of our virtual international conference on transdisciplinary research and innovation for entrepreneurship and sustainability. It is a mark of our underlying tradition to invoke the Almighty at the beginning of all events. So I would like to invite Ms. Aishwarya Jude to lead us with a prayer song. And celebrate his gift of love. We would celebrate the Son of God who loved us and gave us life. We shout your praise, O King. You give us joy, nothing else can bring. We give to you our offering in celebration. Praise. Come on and celebrate. Celebrate, celebrate and sing. Celebrate and sing to the Lord. Come on and celebrate, celebrate, celebrate and sing. Celebrate and sing to the Lord. Thank you, Aishwarya. Before we move on to today's agenda, let's have a small recap of the two-day session in our conference. Over to Tarmi.
technical team. Sustainable entrepreneurship is a dynamic process involving the identification, creation, and exploitation of opportunities that can generate environmental value in addition to economic benefits. On the other hand, research and innovation can be considered as the instrument through which entrepreneurship succeeds. Today, we look forward to giving an exposure about the dynamic issues related to the theme of our conference, transdisciplinary research, sustainable development, innovation, and entrepreneurship. We hope you will learn a lot today. We have lined up for you sessions which are fruitful and engaging. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Umera, the moderator for the first session, to take over. to all my friends from India and a warm good afternoon to our learned and eminent invited speaker of the session, David Wilson, Faculty of Engineering and Technology, the University of Melbourne, Australia. Today is not another day. It is a new opportunity. Learning is a pressure that will follow its owner everywhere. Always walk through life as if you have something new to learn and an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. On behalf of the coordinators and the organizing team of IC Trice 2021, I take this privilege and honor in extending a cordial and warm welcome to Dr. David Wilson, who has been engaged actively with us for the past two days. Our guest speaker is graduated from the University of Western Australia in Geography and received his doctorate in geography from Northwestern University, Illinois. Dr. David is a jack of all trades and, of course, master of all. He is a geographer and transport and logistic researcher. He has been a director of the Ministry of Transport in Victoria, Australia, an executive logistics manager at Willowware, Australia, a transport planner at the Chicago Area Transport Study, and the Southern California Rapid Transit District. He has also acted as a consultant on major transport projects for Bunch, as well as Kmart, Humes Pipes, the Port of Melbourne, Australia Post, and Australian Air, Ex uh, Air Express. Dr. Wilson has been an invited guest lecture, lecturer for many organizations and presented at seminars in Australia and the United States of America. He has delivered lectures for companies all over Australia, in Indo Indonesia, and Singapore. Mm -hmm. Dr. David has held lecturing appointments at the universities of Melbourne, New South Wales, and Monash in civil engineering, geography, marketing, and information systems. He, spe he specializes in supply chain modeling, production operations management, and modeling and simulation. Dr. Wilson has advised Ratio, one of Australia's leading urban and transport planning consultancies on the development of mathematical and statistic models for urban planning. He also aspires to pen a book on research methodology for engineers. 
He is also the principal investigator for many university research grants and consulting projects. Doctor, you are truly an inspiration for all of us. Who emphasizes that age is not a limit for learning with your active participation in almost all lectures from day one of this conference. We really admire this attitude of yours, and I'm sure your talk on the topic, transdisciplinary research, a geographer's perspective, will be an enthralling one. I also extend a red carpet, red carpet welcome to all the eminent guest speakers of today's session. Once again, I welcome you all. Participants, kindly mute your audio and turn off your video during the presentation. You can post your queries in the chat window, which will be addressed at the end of the session. Over to you, Dr. David. Thank you very, very much. Let me... Okay, um, hopefully you can see my screen. Yes, sir. Yes, we can see you. We can ah, see perfect. Perfect. Okay. Well, it's um, it's an honour to be here, and um, I just wanted to... Well, first of all, I want to thank you very, very much for inviting me. I want to thank also um, Nikita Christopher um, <laughs> for being the link to... Um, you know, she asked me if I'd uh, be able to talk, and I, I said yes, and then, then I met, um, you know, Dr. Christopher, so... Um, our, just really, um, I'm overwhelmed. Even though I'm a long way away in Melbourne, I feel um, like I'm very close to you. I also want to um, pay tribute to that beautiful um, singer. That, that was just that's just beautiful. I, 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 I would love to be in choirs. And um, that was gorgeous. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Okay, so now to the um, details of what I'm supposed to talk about. Well, when I talked about, when, when I was asked to talk about transdisciplinary research, or was given a choice of um, transdisciplinary research um, or um, innovation or um, um, entrepreneurship or, um, or sustainability, I, I just chose um, transdisciplinary because I'm very interested in writing on methodology. And as people, um, you know, who do this kind of stuff know, it's a huge area and it's, it's massive. So I, I took up the opportunity to, to get into transdisciplinary research. So I thought, well, what is it? So, you know, you could talk about cross-disciplinary research, interdisciplinary research, transdisciplinary research, or you could talk about transdisciplinarity. And they're all, they're all a bit different. They're all a bit different, but let's, talk about transdisciplinary, but they're all in many ways similar, but um, they have they have different um, emphasis. So I you know pretty basic um, what what is transdisciplinary research? This is for me, okay? It's to grasp the relevant complexity of a problem, to take into account the diversity of life, world, and scientific perceptions of problems to link abstract and case-specific knowledge, to develop knowledge and practices that promote what is perceived to be the common good. It's from the Handbook of Transdisciplinary Research. There's the, um, there's the book there, and you can download it. You can download it. So I did, and I started you know, reading it, and it's, it just, um, well, it's awe-inspiring. It's, it's a massive amount of work. Now, there's also a journal called the in, uh, Integral Review, Transdisciplinary Research, Transdisciplinary and Transcultural Research. So this is another, you know, this is a journal that I, I didn't know about, but, but um, there's be a lot of material um, available on this. So we talk about knowledge um, and theories of knowledge. And um, I, got, I got this from, um, maybe from, um, this organization, which is at the ANU, which is involved in um, in tra transdisciplinary research. So um, they talk we talk about or talk about systems knowledge, target knowledge, and transformation knowledge. So three different types of knowledge. And um, 
in view of this situation, transdisciplinarity was initiated by the Swiss Academy of Arts and Sciences as a forum for transdisciplinary research in order to facilitate capacity building and advancement in transdisciplinary research. So just remember, you know, it was initiated by the Swiss Academy of Arts and Sciences. I'll come to that a little bit later. Now, this is from the, um, from the, uh, the handbook, but basically transformation knowledge, and I, I've made this available to, um, to Trice, so they could um, send it to you if, you if you wanted. Transformational knowledge, it's about technical, social, legal, cultural, um, to basically learning how to make existing technologies um, more flexible. That's the transformation knowledge. That's trying to um, do, do stuff. Target knowledge is actually um, classifying and pr prioritizing the settings of values in relation to common good. Okay, and systems knowledge is about reflecting on and dealing with uncertainties through real world experiments. So these, these three um, concepts together are different facets of knowledge and um, very important in terms of understanding um, transdisciplinary research. So this is really like the scientific method, okay? Problem identification, problem analysis, and bringing results to, to fruition. They, they relate to the other slide. They relate back to this transformation knowledge, target knowledge, and system knowledge. So basically, this, this, is the, this is really the scientific method. But it's very important to realize that it's not linear. Okay, so usually we, you know, we talk about the scientific method, you know, problem identification, hypothesis, methodology, testing, um, and then evaluating. It's a linear process, but this isn't linear. This is this is into in, into um, it's interactive, and it's the three phases of research in transdisciplinary research processes. So, I thought well. Uh, in, to break up the, um, the the presentation instead of just words, this is a word cloud. Which, um, if you um, um, if you go to the Australian National University and their Integration and Implementation Sciences, or IS2, this is their word cloud. Okay, all the different things that it's trying to bring together. Systems thinking is pretty big. Transdisciplinarity is pretty big. Um, interdisciplinary, you know, management science, modeling. Oh, this is all the stuff that I'm really interested in, okay? Operations research, um, cybernetics. So th th this is what it's all, all the different um, themes. And, and it's um, to put together a handbook is, you know, which, which makes sense, which is coherent, is, is really fantastic. Now, if you go to um, IS2 at the University, Australia National University, you'll you'll see one of the um, one of the pages is integration and implement, implementation insights, and I thought this was really really good. It's what they call it's an idea tree. Uh, it's a tool for brainstorming ideas in cross disciplinary teams. So um, I don't know whether you're familiar with the idea of a charrette, or um, at the beginning of a process you come together. Um, different um, participants to solve a particular problem. So they've got different perspectives. This is this is the same thing, but they call it an idea tree. Which I think it's a really good idea, and it's it's from the resources at the Australian Nat National University. Okay, now remember I talked about um, you know um, where this all started at the Austrian um, in, in in Austria. Well, I reckon that this is pretty critical. This is uh, Ludwig von Bertalanffy. He was an Austrian biologist, and he's one of the founders of general systems theory, an interdisciplinary practice that describes systems with interacting components applicable to biology, cybernetics, and other fields. It comes from Wikipedia. 
there there is um, um, Professor um, von Bertalanffy, and that's 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 his book. So I studied this a lot in geography um, way back in the 1960s. This was pretty new new back then. But since then, um, there's also been Jay Forrester at MIT and, and over in England, Stafford Beer, um, who was the president of the Operations Research Society. And he did a lot of work with um, British Steel. So these, there's many, many others, but I've just picked out um, von Bertalanffy because I think you could regard him as the father of uh, systems theory and the originator of the work in Switzerland um, and or oh, sorry in Austria but also look at Jay Forrester from um, I um, from MIT and Stafford Beer. Jay Forrester wrote a book called uh, Systems Dynamics and he published it himself and I've got a copy of it. So why did he publish it himself? because nobody wanted to publish it. Okay, fantastic book, okay. And the Club of Rome um, used his stuff uh, in, in the modeling for, um, for, their, for their work. They're, they're, all the stuff that's going on now, you could trace in, in environmental um, sustainability, climate change, um, all, all of those things, you can tr all trace that back to the Club of Rome. And Jay Forrester was a very important participant in the modeling of that. Okay, so here's from the handbook. This is the idea. This is these are the chapters in the handbook. It's a massive handbook. You can download it. Um, you can see here problem identification. These are chapters related to problem identification. Then there's chapters on problem analysis, and then there's you know bringing results to fruition. Um, these um, these chapters here, and then across here is participation, um, values, and uncertainties. Different, different themes, management, education, really, um, you know, summarizes from what I can see the work at, um, at, at Holy Cross, uh, you know, what, what, what you're trying to do, um, very much so. Okay, so how do we put this together? Okay, so I tried to, you know, come up with some ideas. So disciplines. Now, the, now in transdisciplinary research, the remove the four core core concerns were real world problems, integrating disciplinary uh, paradigms, participatory research, and a search for unity of knowledge beyond disciplines. So here are all the different disciplines, a bit chaotic, and they're all you know different in silos. And you can tell they're in silos because at universities, they're all different departments, different baronial empires. Now, in terms of metaphors, I thought, well, this comes from the Australian National University. This is actually a sculpture at the Australian National University. And you can see it's, you know, it's a block of, um, of granite um, with a piece missing. But on the other side, there's the piece. And if you put them together, they become integrated. So that's one metaphor for what we're trying to do, put things together, things that are actually whole together. Another, another um, concept is, um, and this is a religious um, um, organization uh, or based, based um, on, the, on, on, on that. And so th I was told this a long time ago in Perth by um, um, somebody who said, you know, imagine that the world was um, like a big diamond and um, God created the diamond, but then it was shattered. So there's the shattered diamond. And we, we've been trying to put it back together again since we began, trying to figure out, well, what does it all mean? And so this gets back to, you know, the knowledge basis stuff, which, you know, philosophy of knowledge, epistemology, and also ontology. It gets back to, do we construct reality? You know, is there no such thing as reality? Um, and is it all constructed? Uh, and and, and is, is there a theory of everything? I mean, you know, can the physicists actually put it all together? Because they, at the moment, they can't, but they think they can. So these things are really, um, you know, in terms of the, um, the, of the worldview of, about how, how to do things. And there's a lot of stuff, you know, in um, postmodernism, which is about, you know, we're actually constructing um, everything. And um, I take the view that um, actually 
there is a reality and um, we need to understand it. And the, and the reason why I like being in engineering is that it's very practical, you know, um, and the test of um, an engineering um, uh, design is, does it stand up and does it function? And I'm very comfortable in engineering because there's a whole body of um, theory that you can, you know, rest on, relax in and try and understand. That doesn't happen in marketing and it doesn't happen in management. Now, I know that you're also in management science, but management, management doesn't have core principles like gravity, except maybe it does. And maybe what you're talking about at, you know, in your college, maybe those are the core things. So it's, I think it's pretty profound. Anyway, we've got all these disciplines and they're all, they're all different. So now what I want to do is I want to turn to, um, I think it's four examples um, of different research that I've been involved with, also with um, my, my, my wife. I think that's the, the wrong word. Um, I think it's politically incorrect, my wife. Um, my, my colleague and my very, very smart um, partner. Um, so we did some work together um, on uh, the specialist alcohol drug um, advisory service, SADS. And we did this in a place called Shepparton. And the reason why it's discipline, interdisciplinary is because it involved the patients with drug and alcohol problems. It involved the general practitioners in the community, the doctors. It involved pharmacists, community health workers specializing in drug and alcohol, hospital medical officers, specialist drug and alcohol um, uh, doctor, uh, and, a, and a specialist drug and alcohol nurse. Rumbalara, which was an Aboriginal cooperative, hospital CEO, consultant pharmacist, the Dean of Pharmacy, and me, the geographer, and the Victorian Department of Health was the project sponsor. I can't, I mean, because this is a public, this is a public um, uh, forum, but I, I um, all, all I can say is that, um, you know, sometimes I doubt, is there a God? for us to get this job there must have been I mean, how the hell we wound up with it we did and we got it and we did it it's just amazing so let me tell you a little bit let me unpack a little bit of um of uh, of, of our story okay let me know if i'm running too much over time i can i can stop very quickly okay now here's melbourne so here we are in melbourne and you're in um, um you're in in india uh, at, a, at a wonderful, wonderful place called um, Trichy. And um, this is where um, um, the hospital is up here in, in the Goulburn Valley in Shepparton. And this is a, about a two and a half to three hour drive um, along the highway. This is the river. This is the Goulburn River. It's just a beautiful, beautiful area. Looks fantastic. Looks really, really tranquil. Um, this is the town. This is Shepparton, um, the centre of centre of the town. the uh, The town is a centre for farming, fruit and dairy. Um, the cows. So they've got sculptures of cows um, throughout the uh, throughout the town. Um, you know, for its dairying. It's also um, a fruit centre, and there's a big fruit packing um, plant there called SPC Ardmona. And then this is again the Goulburn, the Goulburn River. So it's just a beautiful town. And you think, gee, it's tranquil, it's fantastic. But un underlying it, you've got real social problems, big social problems. And part of it is um, you know, is is drug and alcohol, uh, particularly with young with young people. And so um what we were um what we were investigating or what we were evaluating was this particular model of care that um, they were um, trialling uh, in, in Shepparton. So, um, you know, you've got a, a, um, a patient um, who has um, problems with drugs or alcohol. A lot of patients, you might think, with well, drugs, they're drug addicts. Yeah, but that, a lot of those patients were actually um, um, recruited through the, um, through the medical system because of painkillers. So a lot of these people became hooked on painkillers so um and they needed them okay so they were also part of it so don't just think of you know heroin and um, cocaine and things like that also um a lot of people um who had accidents and had to take very powerful 
pain medication um, and then they became addicted to it. So in order to help these people, a GP, a uh, family GP is the usual point of contact or the pharmacist. They recognised um, a, a doctor called Andy Lovett who specialised in um, drug and alcohol and pain management. Um, so the doctor would refer to um, to the Shepparton Hospital, Goulburn Valley Hospital, and they would um, be um, evaluated or triaged by um, specialists in alcohol and drug and pain. And then they would begin working with the patients. And we sat in on the interviews with the patients and then we, um, we asked the patients separately, you know, their what they thought was um, going on and how they reacted to it. And we also asked people in the hospital, the administration and, um, and the team, the, the medical team, and we wrote a report. So the, the, um, the patients are, um, are reviewed and a treatment plan prepared by um, Andy, um, who was the specialist doctor. And, and and then they would see Andy and review Andy, and Andy would review their, their their cases weekly or monthly, depending on how seriously impacted they were. But he would then stabilize them and with a with a treatment plan and then discharge them back to the GP. Okay, so that that was the idea. So that the so that the so the GP then took over the management. Um, but the patient had been given a pretty thorough um, plan for um, for um, recovery is not necessarily the right word because drug and alcohol can you know we could talk about them as chronic chronic um, re repeating um, Ill illness. But if you can keep the patient alive, um, you know, through their critical period, they can actually come out the other side naturally, and um, and and live a fulfilled life. Okay, they actually can recover, but it takes a long time. Now the problem is that is this, and this has happened to you know us personally uh, in Melbourne. You got a patient who's you know severely. Um, impacted by drugs or alcohol or you know psychiatric um, issues which can be related to the drugs and the alcohol they see a gp um, they may go to hospital they may come out of hospital um, they see a pharmacist um, they've got their family and friends now in in in, in shepparton there's also the sads team these are all independent operations okay what we were trying to do was connect them in real time with um, iPads or, or phones. We never got to that point. Uh, the funding ran out. But, but anyway, um, that was the idea so that patients would not be alone. Because when somebody's alone, that's when, you know, things can go pretty bad. So the maintenance of these relationships is critical. And so that, you know, if, if the patient doesn't talk to the family for a while, they they can connect with this other t part of the team and 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 find out what's going on. Now, another completely different uh, model that we were um, working on. Um, well, I wasn't working on it, but there's Dr. Wilson down there, um, and there's Professor Duffield, and there's Dr. Huey there. So I work with I work with these people, um, and in fact, I'm tutoring for Professor Duffield's and also for. Dr. Huey and, um, and, and Dr. Wilson. Now, Dr. Wilson's a clinical pharmacist and you might say, well, what's a clinical pharmacist doing, you know, on an infrastructure investment project? Well, um, Dr. Wilson um, was working at Monash University on uh, another project called Radicals, which I'll also show you a little bit about. And um, because she was at Monash, this was a big study um, funded um, and run through the Australia Indonesia Asia Centre, but actually managed through Monash, Melbourne University, University of Indonesia, and uh, Gadjah Mada University. We were working together to deliver uh, this project on infrastructure investment in Indonesia, but it was very difficult working with Monash. Um, and I happened to mention to Professor Duffy, look, you know, 
my wife Sally is is at Monash and she's just finishing her radicals thing, she could help you. And he said, well, yeah, look, that's a good idea because she knows the administration that goes on in uh, at Monash and she could help us with the funding and the movement of responsibilities um, to actually run this big project. So that's how she got involved. And then she wound up, um, you know, um, co-authoring or managing the editorial process for the book. So what this project was about was investigating economic transport, finance and policy for, um, for, for ports. So the, the study was about ports in Indonesia and these, these numbers here, like one, two, three, four, five, these are ports um, and the ports have got special economic zones, okay, throughout Indonesia. And so we were looking at, um, at, at well, they were looking at the ports, particularly focusing uh, on the port at Jakarta, Tanjung Priok and um, uh, Surabaya down here. But there are a lot of other ports uh, in, you know, in Indonesia. And these are the ports in Australia. So this was a study of ports and the people who manage the ports um, in Indonesia and Australia. You can see there's a lot of different ports in Australia. So Sally's, Sally's job was to actually pull this, you know, diverse team together um, so that they could communicate. And that's what, that's what she did. Now, the research process, basically, this comes from um, one of the professors in, uh, I think, Vijamata. Um, he, and, but, but it summarizes what we were doing um, or what they were doing in the study. Online survey, um, focus group, um, focus groups, uh, in-depth interviews, and then case studies um, of the ports. So data collection, initial findings. And then, and then because the professor uh, in Indonesia was interested in the finance side of it, cash flow simulation scenarios for financing and alternative scenarios. So that's kind of like the, um, the, the research process. Now, th these were the disciplines that were involved, engineering and project management, transport and land use, management finance, economics, corporate finance, research students in engineering, government agencies in Australia and Indonesia. So this was a true collaborative international research project. It was fantastic. Um, utilized the skills and knowledge of the various participants, developed strong research relationships, which will continue benefiting benefiting the uh, academics in Indonesia and Australia, and also our students in Indonesia and Australia. Helped mentor the students and showed the value of research and how they could make a positive contribution. Allowed us to get a deeper understanding of each country and allowed us to develop potential business connections. So it was a very, very positive, positive study. So this is, this is, you know, putting it together, this was who was involved. Port of Melbourne, another operator at the Port of Melbourne, another operator at the Port of Melbourne, Austrade, um, big international engineering company, Palindo 2 and 3 ports, these are ports in Indonesia, um, Bapinus, which is the Indonesian um, equivalent, I think, of, um, of Aust no, it's not Austrade, it's, Bapinus is an infrastructure planning agency uh, in Indonesia. It's also, there's also the Indonesian planning agency and Deloitte Asia. So how it proceeded was scoping meetings. That's, um, you know, the um, part of the transdisciplinary approach is the scoping meetings, Australian research forums, meetings and field trips in, in meeting Melbourne and Jakarta, surveys conducted jointly by the universities in both uh, countries, um, online and focus group surveys, in-depth interviews, um, industry workshops in Indonesia and Australia, lots of teleconferencing between the research partners, and um, a final conference in Australia at completion and the production of the book. Couldn't have happened without high level government support federally, um, both in Indonesia federally and in Australia and provincially, because um, you know the provincial um, governors in Indonesia were also critical in helping get us into these, these places. It was, uh, just better go back to that. It was one arm of a larger study funding through the Australian Indonesian Centre to encourage research collaboration. 
Now, last one, last example of, um, of transdisciplinary research. This is the one that um, Sally, Dr. Wilson was involved with um, at, the, at Monash University. It's called Radicals, Review of Airways, Dysfunction and Interdisciplinary Community-Based Care in Adult Long-Term Smokers. It was a National Health and Medical Research um, Partnership. Um, it was a cluster randomized controlled trial in primary care clinics in Victoria, Australia. It identified smokers of over 40 years who were screened for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, followed up by a spirometry intervention and a usual care arm. And they compared these two. Patients in the intervention arm were offered smoking cessation plus COPD management. If they had COPD, they had a home medication review and a home-based pulmonary um, rehabilitation if they wanted it. So it was an interdisciplinary model of care which brought together public health experts, respiratory specialists, general practitioners, pharmacists, physiotherapists, health economists, biostatisticians, and nurses. And the partner organizations were the Lung Foundation, the Inner East Melbourne Medicare Local, Boehringer Ingelheim, which provided a lot of the money, matching funds with the NH and MRC. And the researchers came from different Australian universities. And this is a reference of one of the papers that were published in the Medical Journal of Australia. So almost finished. Um, so just to summarize it all, transdisciplinary research, what are the benefits and what are the issues? Well, there's no doubt that transdisciplinary research gives you a deeper and richer understanding of other disciplines. You can, you can have new experiences and knowledge. There's a lot of value in new experience and knowledge, in new perspectives from different faculties. Um, mentoring of research students. There's an opportunity for relationship building. Um, is a fertile environment for innovation, and there's a and and it's a collaborative learning environment. So these are all the positive things that that come out of it. But in order to do that, I, there's there's issues because you've got a lot of different people involved, a lot of different people involved. And how do you bring them together? How do you coordinate it? Obviously, there's language and cultural barriers, not only between, um, you know, different cultures, but within different um, disciplines, there's different language. And you need to develop a common language so that everybody knows what they're talking about. There's also a siloed mentality and, and um, you know, a, a, an obsession with control or loss of control by the administration. So that that's very difficult to overcome. There's intellectual property issues. There's project management issues. There's the perennial funding issue. Um, there's team dynamics, you know, how people interact with each other um, and, um, and team stability. So people, you know, for example, if you at the COPD study, you know, some people um, leave the study. Some of the patients leave the study some of the patients, you know, die. Um, new patients come in. So st team stability, managing something from the statistical point of view, it's, it's very, very challenging. And then, of course, there's, there's, there's conflict, you know, different approaches, um, different methods, that sort of thing. So, um, so that's, um, that's the presentation. Um, and um, sorry, it took a bit, too, bit, bit too long, but... Um, if there's time, happy to take questions. So thank you, doctor, for that captivating and engrossing lecture. Actually, we feel blessed. Your warm, your voice was warm and soothing, actually. And uh, it, it, it doesn't matter even if it extends. Actually, your speech gave an implementation insights on understanding and acting on real world problems. It showed us a different scenario of real transdisciplinary research from a geographer's perspective. I'm sure our participants would have enjoyed it to the fullest. Uh, so now it is open to the audience for questions. Doctor, I would like to mention one more thing. Actually, I'm impressed with your habit of voracious reading. The way you mentioned the various books, what you have read, and uh, thank you for suggesting those books to us also 
I can give you I can give you um, references, but you know if you just look at the um, the handbook of uh, transdisciplinary research, that's um, that's got a, a massive amount of um, reading uh, reading in there, massive amount of reading, and um, I, I guess the challenge is to um, you know get on top of it and um, but don't worry, I mean just just start uh, you know just just begin. You don't have to. You know, you don't have to get up to the top of Mount Everest. You can just, you can just begin. You know, and um, uh, and and it's it's fun and it's um, it it, it can, I can definitely say it keeps you young. That's for sure. Yes, sir. And working, and working, and working with students keeps you young. Okay, we can understand that, so we can make out that. So I have a question. Shall I ask you? Yes. Okay. Uh, being a biochemist, I'm curious to know what made you choose alcohol consumption and what are the methods you adopted to collect data apart from questionnaire survey? That's a great question. Um, so I'm going to incur the wrath of the people who know me. So I apologize. But to directly answer your question, I am a non-practicing alcoholic. So um, I discovered that um, uh, because my wife um, comes from a family, her culture, where they don't drink. But in Western Australia, we drank a lot. My family drank, okay? Everybody drank in Western Australia, at least that I knew. So I just continued drinking. But I then became addicted to alcohol. And um, so I was seeing a doctor. And the doctor said, well, look, you're not an alcoholic. Um, and, you know, a bottle of red wine a night is fine. But... Um, <laughs> But perhaps you should consider, um, you know, seeing a psychiatrist. So anyway, he, you know, so I went to see a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist said the same thing. He said, oh, you're not an alcoholic. You're not an alcoholic. But um, why don't you go to AA for a few weeks? Because I'm going to give you these pills. Because he gave me these things. It was Arapax. And um, the Arapax um, didn't make any difference. And he said, well, look, you know, you're still drinking and Arapax doesn't really mix. Can you just stop drinking for a while? And um, so um, that, that went on for six months. I couldn't stop drinking. But anyway, so it went on for six months. And then so he said, look, why don't you try AA, Alcoholics Anonymous? So this went on for another six months. I thought, I'm not an alcoholic. Uh, but anyway, eventually I gave up and I said, um, okay. So I walked into the Salvation Army um, um, at, where they had an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. I walked in, it's like a church, and I'm Jewish. I walked in there, and I thought, I felt like I was at home. I felt like I was at home. I thought, wow. And I, I went and saw, I went down to the front, and I said, look, I don't know if I'm supposed to be here, but, you know, the doctor said I should um, come along. Rex looks up at me, and he looks at me, and he says, yep, you're one of us. And that was it. And so I started going to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I, you know, I haven't been there for a while, but that's how it happened. Now, because I'm into this stuff and I know this stuff from the inside, when I'm, you know, with um, the Dean of Pharmacy and my, um, my partner, my wife, who is a clinical pharmacist, um, they got work, um, that they got the, the contracts for um, the Drug and Alcohol Project. And, um, and I helped them because of my statistical knowledge and my questionnaire stuff and all that sort of stuff. So, so that's how I got involved. And because I, you know, in AA, I just know about these things. I know, I know that, you know, there's a, there's a chapter at, um, in, um, you know, in, in Shefferton, there's chapter at Rumbalara. It's so it, that's how it happened. That's how it happened. So that's really interesting, sir. And we are thankful to your wife. Well, so am I. So, so, so am I. And I think the important thing is the message is, you know, that um, you can have really dreadful things like, you know, um, depression and alcohol dependency and all that sort of stuff. And if, and if you do, you know, listen to your doctors like I did, I, it's amazing. So I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my doctors and my wife. I wouldn't be, I, I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't be at the University of Melbourne, which is a very high performing, challenging place to be at, 
um, you know, so I'm very grateful. And you know, you know, and um, you know the beginning of um, the prayer, the, you know, the, for the 13 or 12 steps, you know, um, coming to realize that there is a God and asking God to help you. That's, you know, and that's what I did. I did that all. I mean, that's all I did. I, you know, please, God, God, grant me the serenity for, to, you know, um, to, to, to actually do what I'm doing and, you know, not do stupid things and do the right thing. That's what I did. And it worked. It worked. Thank you, sir. So one more question. That was a very beautiful, uh, soul-touching uh, confession, uh, David. Yes. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank Amazing. you. Amazing. Amazing. Praise God for that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So one more question. What can be the means for us to be collaborated with you for such type of research? Well, it's really easy. I mean, I'm happy to help you. Um, I'm happy to help you. I, you know, so, you know, talk to um, my, my partner, uh, my, my, you know, doc, Dr. Wilson, or um, you know, Professor Duffield, or Prof or Dr. Huey, or or you know, Dr. Wilson. My um, she's also Dr. Wilson is also a um, a um, a fellow at the university with, with with me. We at the unfortunately because of the lockdown, we're we're all at home, but we all you know work together um, in the same you know in the same building when we're allowed back together. So we can work together. It's um it's it's not a not a problem. It's happy to, happy to do that. Happy to do that. So Thank you. the other, the other thing, the other thing is, um, you know, being in engineering, I noticed that, you know, engineers also like to drink because my uncle was an engineer and, um, and he, he was an alcoholic. In mm -hmm. fact, when I look back on my, you know, my family, I had a lot of alcoholics in the family, but the, this is the important thing. There are high-performing alcoholics who just simply can do it and they don't and nothing happens to them, okay? And they get just, they drink and they, they, they're fantastic, okay? They manage it. But I was one that couldn't, okay? So a lot of the people that I work with, and it's not that I work with, but at the at AA, okay, we've, you've got judges, you've got, you know, serious actors, famous people, okay, who've all had the same problem along, you know, with people who are going into jail, people coming out of jail. So we're all in here and we've all got this common, you know, affliction of addiction to alcohol. So, um, you know, that's why I'm happy to share it and help because, it, you know, that's what we do in AA. We help. Thank you so much, Doctor. If we don't have any other questions, uh, maybe we can move to the next session. Thank you so much, Doctor, for being with us and sharing your knowledge and also for that soulful re rendition, as ma'am said. So thank you, participants, for your active participation. Now we it is over to Dr. Jostwin. Thanks so much. Uh... Dr. David, for being with us. A very clear presentation. Thanks so much for the hard work that you have put in to make things very simple to us. Thank you so much. Josephine? Yeah. Josephine? Thank you, Dr. Wilson. And thank you, Dr. Umera, for the wonderful moderation. We shall now move on to the next session. We are honored and privileged to have Mr. Parvez Alam, the CEO of CIIC, Crescent Engineering College, Chennai. He has been instrumental in facilitating the Holy Cross Incubation and Innovation Council, a co incubate of CIIC, striving to enter into innovation and entrepreneurship arena. I now invite Dr. Genova to take over the next session.
this is the day the lord has made let us rejoice and be glad in it good morning everyone entrepreneurs are the central to the country's economic growth and they are the owners of divining the contours of the development entrepreneurial innovation is a mindset survival skill and key to strategic advantages successful entrepreneurship occurs when creative individuals bring together a new way of meeting needs and marketing opportunities capacity building of young talent in transdisciplinary research for a sustainable development of society is the need of the r meeting this need holy cross incubation and innovation council ugc stride one component is organizing an international virtual conference on transdisciplinary research innovation and entrepreneurship for sustainability i deemed it a great privilege to welcome mr parvez alam ceo and director crescent innovation incubation council bs abdur rahman crescent institute of science and technology chennai india to share his experience with us on innovation and entrepreneurship for sustainability the best practices in crescent innovation and incubation council c iic sustainability innovation and entrepreneurship involves traveling across new ground to successfully traverse the reality the relatively unfamiliar territory of entrepreneurship and sustainability we need some person support in the words of tiruvalluvar tamil periya tamara olugudal vanmayul ellam thalai it means the greatest of all strength come from associating with one great than oneself mr parvez alam is that great one passionate towards incubating technology startups and budding entrepreneurs Mr Parvez graduated bachelor's in engineering from Anna University and master's in management from Great Lakes Institute of Management Chennai and Stewart School of Business Chicago Mr Parvez is pursuing his doctor of business administration from SP Jain School of Global Management Australia He is awarded prestigious certifications from ESA and UK such as project management professional and be certified practitioner then many more certificates from us and usa uk and certified chief innovation officer by rochester creation institute new york he also registered technology transfer professional by attp usa mr parvez has 15 years of cross functional experience in strategy marketing program management and operations He has experience in handling programs in automotive, aerospace domain, and spearheaded bilateral research program with Spain and Korea. His last position was the head corporate marketing in UCAL Group, a Taiwan manufacturer in automotive, aerospace, and defense domains. In June 2018, he is taken over as the CEO of Crescent Innovation and Incubation Council. sponsored by bsa crescent institute of science and technology which nurtures startups and entrepreneurs in short span of two years under his leadership cicc has incubated 75 startups 60 patents having 50 more mentors and received more than 10 awards presently he is serving in honorary position such as member of cii Southern Region Forum of Startup Partner and Vice President of PMI Chapter. I welcome you, sir, and I welcome all the participants to this experience series session. Now I invite Mr. Parvez to share his experience. So thank you, madam, for the detailed introduction. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, can you hear me, madam? Can you can you hear me yes, properly? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Can you also see my screen? That presentation. Share? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank I think the screen has the screen has to come into the full screen mode, sir. Yeah. Has it come now? I just made. It's not on the full screen mode. Okay. Now I can see. Yes, sir. 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 Yes, sir.
How can we check? Because I just did that. Uh, Genova, is it on full screen mode? Not it, ma'am. Yeah, not it. I just stop sharing. I just do the uh, stop sharing. Uh, I'm super sure Can you see the screen now? Not yet, sir. So, what should I do in a stop? You know, I feel like we are sharing a window or a screen or that. Which one is uh, right? It's okay, sir. Now? Yes, sir. Now it's perfect. Now okay. it's perfect. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, thanks uh, for the warm introduction and then. Uh, also, thanks, Polygas, uh, uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity to share our best practices. Uh, so, I just give a very, uh, very brief about uh, you know startup ecosystem, and then uh, then I move on what we did in the startup ecosystem. So, as you all are aware that uh, you know India is the third largest uh, global startup ecosystem. Uh, so basically, this uh, ecosystem is uh, uh, meant uh, for. Uh, so this ecosystem is uh, you know uh, mainly based on the number of unicorns. So you see, India is the uh, 61 unicorns, the number three uh, in the global startup ecosystem. And then, if you also see the average time to become a unicorn is six to eight years. So. Uh, what is Unicorn? Unicorn is a company, a startup company which just started, which become a one billion dollar valuation company. Uh, let's say in a, in a six to ten years time frame, or, uh, you know, like Freshworks, which you are keep hearing the news today. It's a Freshworks is a company started in Chennai, and then uh, now they are uh, become a unicorn. Uh, so the unicorn is a one billion dollar valuation. So one billion is of course maybe for some of the final crores. So India is already in the race of startup ecosystem. We are number three. Okay, not only we are number two in the population, but we are also number three. But having said that, uh, now uh, you know India has 1.3 billion population. So we cannot uh, you know give employment for everyone. Okay, so we need to provide employment. That's where the startup uh, plays a role. And then uh, this gives us statistics about how this new unicorn is uh, getting added. Uh, as you see, there are 800 unicorns across the world. And India keeps adding a lot of new unicorns. Uh, so these are the some of the Indian unicorns, like Paytm, Oyo, Baiju, Ola, Spiti, Zomato, Paytm, and so on. Uh, uh, this is the unicorns added in the 2021 itself. Uh, so, you know, there are 21 startups uh, get added as a new unicorn in this uh, 2021. So, which shows that we are very aggressive and uh, part of the, you know, rising startup ecosystem in India. So, uh, what is this growth going to be, okay, in the next five years? If you see that uh, in 2014, we started with five unicorn. Now we are, we are expecting to be an 100 uh, one five plus unicorns in the future, and this is going to create uh, uh, more than uh, 10 hundred thousand jobs. Okay, that is very very important. So we are you know going to produce a lot of jobs to solve the unemployment problem. The current unemployment uh, rate is 90 percent. Okay, so we are going to solve this problem through uh, having startups. So now. Uh, Okay, now the number of startups, which are the segments the startups are bifurcated. Okay, uh, if you see this uh, the software and data, which we call industry 4.0, and then uh, there are startups uh, in the fintech, uh, e commerce, health sector, especially after COVID, uh, and hardware, even in educate, you know, educate. There's social 
uh, you know, impact startups. So these are all going to play a major role. I think these are the provided uh, based on sectors, startups currently evolve. And then uh, now you may ask, okay, you now we have a lot of idea. Now where is the money? Right? So historically, people say that uh, three of that is family, friend, and food are the people who generally support startups. But if you see uh, the idea is in startups, there are so many government grants. So the one which I shown in the pink color are the various government grants are there. So earlier historically only three of us will do, but here now there are a lot of government grants even up to prototype stage. But once you done the prototype, then there are a lot of venture investors and venture companies who is waiting with the money you know, to support it. So there are a lot of provisions for uh, for young and ideas in startup to go to the prototype stage. Now, why incubation center? Okay, now we so far talked about what is the importance of startup and then why it is important for India and then how it will solve an employment problem and so on. Now, what is the role of business incubator? What we call an incubation center. Uh, so, what is the role of business incubator? Now, if you see here, the startups which go through a business incubator route has 20 percent success, whereas the startup which doesn't go to the incubator route because there are many startups. Who still they are not incubated. They don't sit on their own. They have their bootstrapping. Uh, so those incubators, uh, those startups, you know, before having incubator, their success rate is very very low. That's the so incubator has the law adding lot of value. So I just want to give a very uh, very quick uh, difference about the incubator accelerator because this is the two words which we interchangeably use. So incubator is like a UG program. Accelerator is like a PG program, uh, say in a very simple sentence. Because incubator for early stage startup for high growth stage, uh, an incubator where you collect some service charges, preferably not for profit, academic in nature, whereas in accelerator you collect DPT. And typically, incubator uh, nurtures a startup who are in the zero to uh, two crore sales turnover. After once they reach two crore or plus, uh, then accelerator will help. So what impact we have created uh, as the incubation center, we are just uh, two and a half years old incubator. Uh, so we have a 75 startups, uh, 4.92 startup grants received by our startups, 30 plus crores of annual investments raised by our startups. Uh, plus our startups are doing well since turnover. So many of them are started uh, making product and then selling. And then uh, we got a lot of uh, international partners and sixty plus patents, four hundred and fifty plus jobs are created through startups. You know, that is very important. And then uh, we also recognize by Minister of Education, five star rating, and the other ranking of institutions on brand A. Uh, we are funded by uh, Department of Biotechnology, uh, Government of India, the one by Group Fund. Plus, we also uh, got a fund from uh, Startup India, C fund scheme, which is a uh, fund, which we are helping and then supporting startups. So, we have, uh, you know, four category of startups, what we call external, alumni, student, and faculty. And then these are the three sectors we are working life sciences, industry, four and four, and mobility and These are the three verticals of startups are uh, so we have startups starting from ideation stage, prototype, revenue, and growth stage. We have 13 women, exclusive women next startups. And then you can see the breakup of uh, in life sciences we are having in medtech, agritech, and then uh, pharma side, the industry for that we have startups working in big data, augmented reality, cloud computing, uh, you know, IoT, and so on. So we are part of this uh, Ministry of Innovation, uh, Ministry of Education's Innovation Cell. Um, as you all know, there is a policy framework in place to support in education achievements. Uh, so they have various initiatives starting from Smart India Hackathon, Institution Innovation Council, uh, ranking. There is a national innovation startup policy for students and faculty to become a, a startup, and they, they connect a lot of different hackathons. So the idea of this government of India. So we, as I said, we have a lot of population, and we're getting a lot of graduates. We have a lot of demographic women, and everyone cannot get a job. So how do we promote jobs, and how do we give them jobs? Is where we are. 
so uh, we are our startups have participated in the smart india hackathon and they are one of the winners uh, you can see a uh, agri based startup who is making a electric tractor we also hosted a thai hackathon which is a ministry of education and eight ministries joined how this thai market you know, you know how we you bring innovation to thai market thai market uh, our prime minister modi says that uh, you know thai is really having a rocket science and then uh, but still we are importing 1.5 billion dollar of thai but and then how do we solve the you know how do we talk the new ideas that thai and then how do we localize the thai market uh, how do how do we make india industry to make thai so that's what the, the thai hackathon in fact we are one of the noted centers to do that so we actually participate in all things and then uh, there is a um, as i told the national innovation startup policy which drives the entrepreneurship activity in academic environment I'm sure Holy Cross management is very active. They're very keen. Uh, they are also uh, one of the co-innovation partner with us. Uh, so we have made our uh, policies in place so that the student and faculty uh, can become an entrepreneur as well as uh, their uh, patents and their IPRs also get protected. So this is our model that uh, we have tied up with the Vanvani Foundation. It's one of the non-profit association. Uh, You know, giving advocacy on, on startups and uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, so our students will go through a handholding process of doing a project, and they get to a mentoring. Uh, then uh, they will get the seed funding, and then they will also go through a course on constructional entrepreneurship, advanced entrepreneurship by the study. And then uh, you know, uh, they actually by the time they graduate, they become an entrepreneur. So this is our structure. Uh, once the students uh, has interest on entrepreneurship and innovation, they will first join. First, they will join as a member in the Crescent Innovation Startup Club. Then uh, you know the APJ Innovation Center, which we have formed, where they will give a seed fund of up to fifty thousand. Uh, so they will come up with a project, and then once they come up with a you know a mature product, then we help them to innovate. The structure process. So we would say that you know the startup club is like a school, the other club innovation center is like a UG program, and CS is like a PG program. So we have a step by step process. So the proof of the pudding is in eating. So somehow for a student startup, whom we are funded, uh, maybe we see from here twenty thousand, fifty thousand. So they are actually now they are fully startup with a good job on the ground. This is a case in how a student started as an engineering, you know, as a student, you know, he is a, a alumni startup. Uh, how he go through all the student startup club and then this incubation center, and then he has been selected as one of the DSP program. Then he got a grant from Ten Lab. Now he got a Twenty Lab. So it is a medical based startup. Uh, he helping in connecting to this hospital. So it's an end to end process. How a student is completely converted to startup. Similarly, uh, how an external startup who came for uh, built a prototype, and then we help them connecting them to uh, market. Right? We are helping raising the investments of 70 lakhs uh, through our network. So we handle uh, startups at different stages. So this is a case study of how an revenue stage startup came to us, and then how we help them to connect to. So now uh, we are helping them to connect. Various market needs. Now we are taking the startup to uh, Dubai next month uh, to connect them to Middle East market. In fact, sponsored by you know, government of Canada. Uh, so uh, our model is uh, we we call two club that is mentor, money, and market. So once startup comes, we handle them both technical and business wise entry, and then uh, we help them to raise funds to be a government seed fund and private investment. And third is uh, helping them to connect with industry and then networking and then acting in their own spirit to develop their market needs and then reaching their products and services to the market. So this is uh, we call the Dublin strategy. I'll be explaining it. So now uh, we also act like a launch pad. You know, incubation center. If you want, you can't only you cannot only see only the clinicals and similar halls. You can also see that. Uh, In our for startup technology products, we are adopted. The sense we deployed in our uh, incubation center. So this is a startup product called Smart Water Meter, uh, which will provide the leakage and blockage in the irrigation systems. 
through sensors. So it's application of uh, IoT in the American sense. Uh, again, this is another uh, you know startup uh, machine agriculture. So two startups jointly set up this unit. So it's available in CIC. And then uh, we actually grow this. It's an autonomous farm. We grow vegetables here, and then we sell it for candy. Uh, here it is like a walk the talk. Uh, people talk about so many about their startups, but here if you come and you can see actually here uh, uh, technologies deployed by our startup implemented at the uh, information center. So this is again a robot uh, which is uh, made during the COVID scenario to detect the thermal sensing of the body temperature, the mask detection, automatic sanitizer dispenser, and so on. So this is actually uh, made by one of our startups and deployed in our campus. Uh, this is again a startup uh, who is making an automated uh, cold storage system, uh, especially for uh, you know customized equipment. For example, the current cold storage system, like you store apples, you store mushrooms and vegetables and so on. The current storage system, the large storage system, is like a normal fridge. Uh, you know, the shelf life will not go. For example, if you are sending apples to Middle East. You can't uh, store it uh, more than you know a couple of months, but uh, but if you understand the respiration nature of it, each and every vegetable, for example, apple emits ethylene, mushroom emits uh, CO2, but if you understand the respiration nature, like human being loves to respirate, so uh, there is the startup who came up with the sensor which detects their respiration. For example, uh, uh, you know the app. Apple emits ethylene, so they take the ethylene gas out uh, to the ethylene rubber. So the shelf life of apple will increase to two weeks, twice. Similarly, uh, mushroom emits CO2, so they does the CO2 control and rubber. So this facility is available in CS, done by our CS partner. So um, again, um, this is again a CHC startup which made the biogas generation facility. They collect all the food waste from the campus and then uh, they feed that uh, in the form of gas back to the cafe, kitchen. So this is, I talked about the student startup, I uh, won the Smart India uh, yeah, Award and uh, they made an electric tractor, an autonomous electric tractor. This is a startup who has, uh, you know, made a e-health monitoring, this is deployed in the central campus. So, uh, we have our startup have received various uh, grants, uh, EDA grants. The EDA is the Entrepreneurship Development Institute of Tamil Nadu. We are the first incubator in the state to get large number of uh, grants for our startups. Similarly, some of our startups have gone and uh, raised uh, good grants, uh, even up to 120 lakhs, uh, 1.2 crore grant from ICMR, the Biodiversity grant of 50 lakhs. And one startup got this indoor Spain project uh, from PSD, which is 110 lakhs. So we help the startups in getting various government grants, starting from 2 lakhs up to 1.1. These are the startups who have raised private investments uh, from our. Uh, so we have mental pool, uh, we have a separate mental pool for life sciences, uh, industry 4 uh, and as well as. Uh, Business uh, mentoring, especially for investment. So, uh, in a nutshell, we are a one stop shop, right? You know, from starting from office space, company preparation, pattern registration, trademark filing, pricing investment, going to the market, uh, you know, connecting to the industry. So, it's all that's one stop shop. So, we have a lot of other facilities uh, where, you know, we have set up a plant tissue culture lab. Uh, to help farmers, so we also concern equally for helping for uh, society. Uh, so we have someone made in a uh, you know liquid fertilizer converting from algae. So these are various marketing tools. Uh, it is almost worth of ten lakhs worth of marketing tools we provide free for our startups once they incubate this. So we also partnered. We are the first one in the country to partner with the ITM. Right? As a going question, as the word going question says, uh, you know, the senior business incubator helps the junior business incubator. Similarly, we go incubate with the uh, Holy Cross. Uh, you can see that, uh, and 
then similarly we have a two more uh, institutions where we do, uh, you know, we help them to nurture their business. So we also uh, have a tie-up with the CCAM, the Center for Cellular Molecular Platforms, uh, one of the BIRAC funded facility. Uh, we help them to act like a technology uh, As you all know, maybe you would have heard about the word for spin-up uh, in West, uh, especially in US, there are a lot of spin-ups. Means the startup may not to go to their own idea. They can go to the universities, they can be office of technology transfer, uh, they have a lot of patents. They are transferring and then the startup can go and take it and then they execute it. That's called spin up. That is in India, we call startup uh, where they have to come up with an idea. So, but there are many people even come and ask me, sir, I want you to give me an idea. So, that we don't do right now, but our technology transfer will help. So, we started this process so that we collect all the guidelines from academic world and then try to feed the idea to the startup. We have a lot of uh, international partnerships, uh, uh, especially in the Middle East and Netherlands, and then Europe and so on. Uh, we, we are very keen for international collaborations, as I said. Uh, we want to take our startups and then we are fully participating in the Bright Eyes Future Stars, which is one of the flagship uh, Middle East uh, events. Uh, we are sponsoring four of the startups. and the research labs. Uh, we promote a lot of women entrepreneurship, so uh, we work closely with Pinky Flow, Pinky uh, Ladies Organization to promote women entrepreneurship. Uh, so these are various uh, partners, starting from government and ecosystem partners. We work very closely with the investors, uh, as well as other uh, industries and international organizations. So our the proof of the pudding is in eating. So our startup have received a lot of awards, uh, starting from Silicon Valley Tech Award, MMX Institute Award, and so Project Management Institute Best Project Management Award. So uh, so C S also started uh, getting a lot of awards, uh, getting ideas for the ecosystem. So we are very young institution. So, uh, we recently got the Startup Industry Fund of Five Tours. We are distributing and helping. And then we uh, came up with the uh, top 20 figures recently by Terminal Startup Check. Uh, recently, for, we are helping the directors and I, uh, police uh, central crime branch, uh, for promoting their uh, you know, schemes to the public uh, very innovatively. So we have a set of separate board of directors and board of advisors, and we have exclusive team who will help uh, for all these software startups. So uh, we have a long vision. Uh, being a young organization, we are looking for vision, and then uh, so our vision is to have uh, you know establish a you know, first of its kind the bioengineering hub. Uh, we have engineering institution. Plus, we are also now getting a course on biotech business data. So we want to combine both. And uh, plus, we want to create advanced facilities for startups. We have a good fit with this part with the SFT. Now we are upgrading to plus another part with the startup facility. And we want to do a lot of more international collaboration, help the startups to grow uh, globally. And then uh, we also help them in access. I already told that you can incubate access. So we are uh, incubator, we want to elevate ourselves to the accelerator, a very better form, and then target more number of startups. Uh, okay. So that's about the plan for setting up the bioengineering uh, combining biology and uh, all engineering discipline. And uh, these are the some of the world class facilities we have planned uh, to establish this uh, center. And then uh, more international collaborations and so on. And then we are tying up with various accelerators. CIM is one of the accelerators where we are collaborating with this. So that's about a uh, very uh, short uh, overview about and best practices about what we do. Uh, it's, it's my privilege to share uh, this experience at this August gathering. Um, I 
think uh, I thought I interact more and take more questions so that I could share uh, some of our learnings and then also learn from from all of you. Thank you, sir. You have shared with a lot of data and the statistical evidence of the startups and the ICIC supports. And we are very much to thank you for your experience sharing. If any student, your operation model is very helpful in all the ways to meet the requirements of the individuals to become an entrepreneur. Audience, if you have any questions, you can discuss now with the resource person. Uh, ma'am, uh, I have two questions, ma'am. Shall I yes. ask? Yes, yes, sure. You can clarify your doubts with the resource person. Uh, yes. Uh, sir, uh, how to uh, find an idea, uh, incubate an idea and start your own uh, startup or a business, sir? Uh, I'm not able to listen with the audio for this word. So, can you repeat the question? Maybe close to the mic. So, uh, how to uh, eat an idea or uh, how to incubate an idea and start? Uh, uh, Sir, can you share with us something about uh, CIC and the innovation work that you are carrying out there, sir? Yeah, yeah. So basically, I think if I understand that question, like, you know, incubate an idea. So uh, as I told that what we needed is uh, the most is basically an idea. So you have, when you have an idea, you have to approach the increasing sector. For example, like Polyclass has an institution, innovation council, and we have. So you can walk in each and here. So what we does is that uh, you know uh, how this idea is scalable. See today the startup uh, you know world is very very glamorous because of the investors, right? We see Flipkart, we see Freshworks, and scalable this idea is okay. And then number two is they are looking at the passion of the founder, and the third is the innovation. Okay. Now we look at all these aspects in a start. Yeah, right. So she has that she has an idea, she can come and talk to us. We will evaluate that idea. We are we say that what is the problem we are going to solve? Who are your customers? And then is there any similar solution already made? And let them we ask so many questions. So when you get answer, you may not be able to answer all the questions at the first time. But when you start answering all these questions, you will get an idea, and then your idea gets shaped, get molded. You have already raw idea. You will get molded after we discuss with this uh, with this template. Then we will put across into a proper method. So as I said, uh, we handle the mentoring. Then we support them to raise funds through money. And we reach out and we reach out to the market. This is our process. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you so much, sir. And one more query was asked from the audience. Uh, you are providing a lot of services, but a lay, pe lay person, how can approach them, approach you to fulfill their uh, startup ideas to become a startup? Yeah, you have to, you know, you can write it to us, you can uh, you can go to our website, you can see our facility, what do you want, you can write to us, you can walk in any time, we are working here, we have full time staff, we'll take care of our facilities, they'll explain that what we offer, what we have, then you can think about what are the other services we provide. So, like, it's like a one stop shop, when I say one stop shop, I really mean it. Um, you are one end to the give you, you need not to go out anywhere. So, even we don't have such facility, you can contact some other incubator who has a facility and then try to help you. So, that's what we do. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. One more question, a last question. And the, the audience is posted over here. And we have heard that is, uh, your CIC provides a seed grant for startups. And what are the criteria to have? To yeah. you to set up, sir. Yeah, yeah. So the see, we provide a lot of uh, seed grants. Uh, one is Tamil Nadu government, another is uh, central government. Another is we are the, we do it on our own. Uh, but the state government is uh, give seed grant of two lakhs to five lakhs. 
And then Sergio uh, Roman Grant, we actually have a kind of startup industry for the five crore. We can give up to maximum 50 lakhs. So, in fact, all of our uh, startups have uh, got this uh, grant. Uh, so, it will come either in the form of debt, equity, or uh, the grant. Uh, so, there is an online form which you need to fill up. It's called Startup India Seed Fund Scheme Portal. You can apply online there. Similarly, for state government, uh, so the application comes to us. So, you want to choose as our knowledge partner. Similarly, for state grant, uh, EDI, IBP, Innovation Merchant Program, website is there. You can apply it there, and then you get an application form online. Here, you have to choose uh, CIC Present Innovation Information Council as a knowledge partner. Then we will uh, guide you, the, help you in making the presentation. And then uh, once you, there's a committee uh, which is shortly this presentation and provided So, uh, I guess, okay. yes, ma'am, carry on. How do we successful in entrepreneurship? How do we be successful in entrepreneurship? It's very, a very tough question. Uh, maybe you, will, you have to hear about what other entrepreneurs say. But as you all know, uh, entrepreneurship is also a matter, but it's also high risk. Uh, the failures are more. So that's why you uh, need to come to Intuition Center and then get educated, where we will tell you what not to do rather than what to do. So we say don't repeat these mistakes. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very tough game, but uh, once you succeed, you know, you can be a billionaire, right? So that's what the fresh books uh, is part of them, giving a message to all of us. So otherwise, you could have continued as a uh, normal employee in Zoho. Uh, so he took a risk out. So, uh, so success is very difficult to define in entrepreneurship. But, uh, you know, there are steps which you need to follow so that the success is guaranteed. That's what we as an incubator will help you do. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. One more question from the audience. And you are more informative and very resourceful person. It seems that a lot of questions that come from the audience. Yes, sir. Uh, here, one of the uh, staff members is clarifying her doubt. Uh, a student starts with a product, but uh, half of the way through, they drop off. How do you manage in your center? This is in your, from your institution. Yeah, see, we help a lot of uh, student startups. The one is uh, nowadays the placements are big down. So we even encourage the students saying that you take this entrepreneur to alternate career. You give startup. Even if they do startup and then they get dropped out, as you say, they don't like this Karana company. If they want to come and do the placement, again they can come and approach. Up to two years, a placement officer will help in getting them again placed also. So that option is given so that uh, they have to learn it. They have to uh, they have to get their hands dirt and uh, learning entrepreneurship. It's, it's not like a white collar job, so like a blue collar job. And so we provide all such uh, ambience uh, for startups, especially student startups. Uh, Sheila, ma'am, do you have any questions? No, no, no. Uh, we can you have open with you? No, no, no. Thanks uh, so much, uh, sir. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity, ma'am. Yes, then, sir. Uh, thanks to the principal uh, who are very closely working with us. So thank you, no, ma'am, for doing yeah. a great job. Yeah, congratulations. We thought uh, whatever in stride and IIC we have learned has to reach a larger mass. Uh, the best practices that uh, your institution follows. So that is why we were very particular that you should address uh, this gathering uh, because uh, this will be a great eye opener to many as to what uh, CIIC is uh, doing in terms of innovation and entrepreneurship and encouraging young uh, people to participate. So we are very, very honored to have you and thank you so much for sparing your time despite your uh, busy schedules. Thanks uh, so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, sir. thank you, sir. Thank you. Management. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am, Sheila. Yeah. And on behalf of the management and organizing committee, I would like to thank you, Mr. Pavis Alam, for his thought-provoking and experience sharing session. The session helped us to use the various support which your Crescent Innovation Center offers. 
and we can make use of the help your startup and we can start many own startups with our students and thank you so much sir thank you dear participants for your active participation thank you so much thank you all of you yeah thank you all Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Parvey Salam. Your speech was very inspiring, and it still shows us that we have a long way to go. May I now request Dr. Sureka Felix to introduce our next speaker and take over the session on innovation and entrepreneurship. Hello, good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yes, sir. Warm greetings sir. from very good morning from Dubai. Uh, Welcome, uh, Marco. We are very pleased to have you here. This is uh, Sheila Christopher. Thank you, Sheila. God bless you and the uh, yeah. pleasure to, to, to hear and see you. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to your presentation. Uh, this session will be uh, moderated by uh, Dr. Sureka. So she will introduce you first, and then you could do your uh, presentation. Sureka? Thank you. Yes, yes. Good morning to one and all connected virtually. I, on behalf of the Holy Cross College, Tirushrapalli, extend a cordial welcome to each one of you present here to enrich their knowledge in International Virtual Conference, TRICE 2021, Transdisciplinary Research and Innovation for Entrepreneurship and Sustainability. With eagerness and anticipation, I'm happy to welcome and introduce the resource person, Mr. Markus Selakovic, Director, International Institutional Development, Head of Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Serbia, for this session on innovation and entrepreneurship, how to thrive from an emerging country. Marco is a manager, researcher, and scholarly academic who is occupying various senior roles at SP Jain School of Global Management, Dubai campus. He's a strategic management and communications professional with more than 15 years of top level experience in Europe and the Gulf countries. Marco is specialized in strategic and international communication and development, stakeholder relations and crisis management. He's also head of Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Serbia, Dubai office, business director of Expo 2020 Serbia, and vice president of International Association of Business Communicators, Gulf Chapter. Marco is author or co-author of numerous research papers related to the education, innovation, strategy crisis, and internal communication. I extend a warm welcome you to sir. With eagerness, I hand over the session to Mr. Marco. Over to you, sir. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Doctor, for a wonderful introduction. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure and blessing to be uh, at such inspiring session and in such inspiring group. I was thinking a lot about the topic of uh, our discussion today, and uh, from my perspective, it is very difficult, very, very complex question how to address the challenge because there is no universal answer to the question what brings an emerging country to the pathway of the success. The reason for this is the fact that uh, each and every emerging country has its, has its own way to go on, has its own way to move on, has its own way to identify and present what is critically important for the development of entrepreneurship and development of the innovative ecosystem. So I will uh, focus rather on talking and instead of classic presentation, which we are all somehow used to, I will guide you through a couple of uh, different examples and cases from my professional experience and uh, from uh, my personal insights I'm having. So at the very beginning, let's start. Uh, do you know what is the biggest event this year in the world? The biggest event in the world this year is Expo 2020. Expo 2020 starts in Dubai today, 
this evening will be the opening ceremony of uh, the World Exhibition. And uh, at the World Exhibition, 191 country will present the best they have, the most innovative they have, the most competitive they have across the globe and present it in front of more than 25 million different visitors spanning across schools, business people, universities, governments, uh, public institutions, and so on and so forth. So, basically, it's a privilege to be in Dubai right now and to witness uh, Expo 2020 and to have an opportunity to see how each and every of the countries will uh, present the best practice in development of the innovative ecosystem, innovation supportive ecosystem, and in the development of the entrepreneurship. And it will be a privilege to me, uh, say, not only to be in position to present uh, the best of uh, Serbia business program, but also to learn about business programs of other countries. So let me go a bit to the background and let me go a bit to uh, some facts we need to discuss on. So the first thing is, what is the emerging country? The question is, uh, who defines the term emerging country or developing country? Some countries have very high level of development in certain disciplines and they are still considered to be a developing country. I'll give you an example of India. India has huge propulsive growth in information technology sector, has a huge tradition in academia, in particular Tamil Nadu as area has a huge tradition and, and, and uh, one of the oldest academic higher education institutions actually, I think the first university-like institution in the world originates from Tamil Nadu and this makes my job to present today even more complex and more difficult. Uh, at the same time, India is one of the world leaders when it comes to pharma, uh, when it comes to medicine, to medical sciences. And uh, at the same time, India is considered to be an emerging country. The same applies to Serbia. Serbia being a land, landlocked European country, uh, very small with 7 million population uh, only, is the country that is considered to be emerging country, having emerging economy, and at the same time leading Europe when it comes to blockchain technology, leading Europe when it comes to high technology innovation, leading world when it comes to foreign direct investments per capita, so it is huge question mark. What does it mean emerging? Therefore, please allow me to start by defining what the term emerging means. Usually when we think about it, we think it is meaning of the emerging is that there is room for improvement. This is politically correct uh, creation that is made elsewhere and that is served well served by the media but the point of uh, emerging means that there is potential to grow further that does not mean that there is need to improve there might be need to excel some countries need to improve certain things but at the same time they need to develop the position where they can excel and thrive on the things that are strategic priorities of the countries. So to go back to the point of uh, innovations first, the key thing, and this I'm saying this with the, the experience of exposure to the government, uh, experience of uh, being part of those who decide about uh, the development of economic policies. The key thing and the key aspect uh, for development of innovations is to create supportive ecosystem 
that embraces innovation. That means, above all, give freedom to people to innovate. Make procedures straightforward and easy. Number three, make the legislation to be supportive, not to be a barrier for the innovation, but to be supportive. Number four, create a system for the incentives that will support innovations that have practical application in the priority areas. That means the state or country needs to identify priorities, of course, first. And then, based on the priorities, you define what are the priority areas, and then you create support measures for different innovations that will come from individuals or enterprises within that framework. Uh, and last but not least, retain the talent in the country. Sometimes this is what countries that are still economically not as strong as some other countries, sometimes uh, the countries forget how to retain the talent. And then they pay very high cost on the other end because not only they are losing money from the tax and uh, from the employment of uh, new people that can happen thanks to the innovations, they are also losing a lot of knowledge, know-how, soft skills, and all other things that can be very, very useful for the future. So when it comes to the creation of innovative ecosystem, those five aspects are critically, critically important. And they need to be taken into consideration when we are talking about innovation. Otherwise, the one can innovate but maybe innovation will be executed elsewhere. So the point is to create the ecosystem that will keep both innovation and innovator inside the country, within the country. Then later on, when innovation is protected, when you have uh, copyrights, when you have patent rights, when all these intellectual property issues are at place, then you can take it forward. But initially, if you do not have supportive legislation, if you do not have environment that can embrace innovation, if you do not have proper strategic priorities, proper incentive system, and if you do not intend to keep good people in the country, then the risk of losing both innovation and innovator is very high. Serbia had to learn it on a very painful way. Uh, Nikola Tesla, very famous scientist, we all heard about Nikola Tesla, uh, he's Serb by origin. However, he built his career in the US because at the late 19th century, there was no understanding for his thoughts and ideas. Nowadays, we learned a lesson, and nowadays there are programs that has for the only, as the only aim to promote innovation, to support innovation, to support innovators, and to retain innovators. So these moments are important. Everyone can make mistake. Everyone can lose some good privilege or opportunity thanks to the mistake that has happened. We are not the imperfect ones, only God is the perfect one. We are, we are always, we all as human beings are imperfect. So basically the point with innovations and with innovator is create environment and ecosystem. Embrace the innovation and retain the innovator. And when it comes to entrepreneurship, innovation and entrepreneurship are going uh, hand by hand. I will share the screen just to show you what, for example, we are doing for Expo 2020 Dubai that starts exactly as discussed today. So let me just 
open uh, the screen. Just give me a second. Let me see. Just give me a moment to start sharing. And to see if I can manage here. Yeah. Okay. I hope you can see my browser. So I will just type. And go ahead. So for the need of Expo, we want to present uh, our country being an emerging country as innovative economy. We want to present it as a country where entrepreneurs are innovative, where academic institutions are innovative, where uh, it is all about creation and innovation. Uh, even if you look into how Serbia presents itself at Expo, uh, the topic is inspired by the past, we create the future. So we use the team of 7,000 old, uh, 7,000 years old Vincha civilization to describe uh, that Serbia was hub for innovation even thousands of years ago. And I see strong similarity with India and Tamil Nadu in particular. Tamil Nadu as a state is one of cradles of innovation. It is one of cradles of trade. It is one of cradles of academia, one of cradles of international relations. My belief is that uh, countries and states need to leverage on that. It's critically important. So let me go and uh, just guide you very quickly uh, through what we are doing and how we are doing. So aside from Expo, which is, of course, very attractive and where you need to be very fancy and to present the best you're having, I will show you Serbian pavilion, which is really state of the art pavilion and which really has a lot of features and uh, uses VR to provide unique experience to the visitors and to business people. Uh, we also set Serbia Business Hub to be one-stop shop for Serbian companies that want to present themselves during the Expo. Why this is important? The state, the country needs, emerging country needs to support entrepreneurs because successful entrepreneurs will generate more income. More income means more tax. More tax means more funds for the state for developmental projects. So it is a wheel. It's a wheel. Sometimes state officials do not understand, do not comprehend that it is all interconnected, all intertwined, and there is a chain. So you need to support the entrepreneur as a country, as a state, as a government, in order to get to, to empower the entrepreneur to enable its growth and Consequently, to ensure that more and more income and more and more tax and more and more workplaces are generated thanks to the success of those entrepreneurs. So for the Republic of Serbia, Middle East market is very important. Uh, it is one of critical markets and uh, we consider uh, it as a hub towards not only Middle East, but also also Southeast Asia and uh, and Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, we consider it to be billions people market. And uh, given that fact and uh, having this in mind, uh, we have decided to set a home for Serbian entrepreneurs where they can work together, they can spend time together, they can see each other, they can invite their partners, uh, where we can invite companies from all the countries in the world that will be present during the Expo uh, to meet and to have proper business to business matchmaking with our entrepreneurs. And actually, the concept is that we are creating 
delegation, which is like national team. For a national team, India national team in cricket, you uh, the head coach will select the best players. We are trying to do the same with the enterprises. So uh, the government is encouraging entrepreneurs to compete in positive uh, terms. So to share, to exchange, to add value to each other, to grow and then to outgrow each other based on their healthy and sound competition. That's the concept, that is the logic. And this is why, for example, in the formation of business delegation, we did not look who is the biggest. We looked actually after that, who is the most innovative. And I'm now going to examples of some companies. So you have the company that made uh, application that is dealing with uh, eating in the sustainable way. You have a energy expert group, which is developing uh, infrastructure for uh, e-cars, which is apparently the future. There are developmental funds. There is faculty uh, of technology with a lot of spin-offs, uh, very innovative startups. There is Dunabnet, Danubnet, which is very, very innovative company itself, providing different geographic solutions. Similar is with Inza. Techno Export has a new approach and uh, strong energy savings on uh, uh, HVAC, HVAC solutions. Bosses is doing light materials, very special materials. Alumarcom is doing completely innovative concept of solar panels that are based on the aluminum, not on regular solar cells. Matter and control is dealing with smart metering of flow of water, gas, and other pipeline liquids. Fluids. Science and Technology Park uh, enables entrepreneurs and startups from a certain region to grow together. Super Lab has advanced lab solutions, some rapid tests. Apatim Brewery has a strong contribution to circular economy because they are using waste generated in beer production uh, for sustainable energy. Guarantee Fund, eh, this is government entity that provides guarantees for the business entities uh, to support their export. Then we are having Comet Consulting, which is creating, again, innovative energy saving solutions uh, for reducing fuel consumption of trucks and machines in the construction. Sir Econ, as the name says, circular economy, is dealing with the circular economy solutions. We are having another science and technology park uh, gathering together uh, startups from South Serbia. We are having NLPS, which creates uh, new sustainable solutions in energy, uh, electric energy transportation. We are having Ono Bikes that created together with Harley Davidson. They have created entirely new generation of e-bikes. It is a breakthrough, one of the breakthrough products. Uh, Citel Media is also dealing with uh, green air, with air purification. Torlak Institute is a state-owned institute that is specialized for smart testings, vaccines production, and so on and so forth. And we are having integrated engineering solutions, ASW. Further on, there are waterworks. Uh, there is, uh, you can see some, Poduhat is the company that is doing some, again, specific uh, solar turbines. Michelini is dealing with uh, wood. Esotron, you can see machinery. Biotechnica, again, testing and metering. Construction cluster that supports innovations. Worldwide Life Fund and Low Office just to support the efforts of the companies. So you can see the concept. All the companies that will be presented only during the first thematic week. So only during the first thematic week of Expo, this is only for week one, and the Expo will last six months. All, almost all the companies have innovation in the center of their operations. And this is something what actually adds value. Because when you have highly innovative companies, then it is not overly difficult to attract the interest of the investors. It is not overly difficult to attract the interest of prospective business partners because 
everyone is open to innovation. Everyone is open to hear, see, witness, and listen about the innovation. And at the same time, what is the role of the government? The role of the government is to support the efforts of the companies uh, to showcase the innovation in the best possible way. Meaning that uh, all these companies are having strong subsidies to travel. So their travel to Dubai and from Dubai is covered by the government. Uh, the costs of business hub are covered by the government. The costs of uh, Serbia Pavilion are covered by the government. Uh, so their only cost is to pay for accommodation in Dubai, and that's all. And they have a chance to present at the world's biggest event and to partner with thousands of companies across the globe. That's another important point, and this is also forgotten. Emerging countries, entrepreneurs, businessmen from the countries that are growing right now should connect and grow together. The world nowadays is global. We need to take that into account. In the global world, people need to connect. People need to liaise to each other. People need to talk to each other. There are some powerful uh, mechanisms and institutions. We are sometimes for forgetting that they, they still exist. I will give you one example. There is something what is called non-aligned movement. Non-aligned movement actually uh, is an international organization established in 1961 by that time Yugoslavia, India, uh, Ghana, uh, Egypt, and Indonesia. So that was the core group of five countries. Uh, and uh, actually, non-aligned movement uh, was the place where developing or emerging countries were gathering together, exchanging, sharing, and so on and so forth. I see that there is raised hand, so just let me finish the point and then I will happily hear your question. Uh, so there are still platforms similar to non-aligned movement. Even non-aligned movement, although it lost political importance, it did not lose economic or business importance. Who prevents and what prevents the countries to cooperate? Does the fact that we are economically not powerful enough to hold the entire process of hardcore development of infrastructure or ecosystems, does it mean that we should not cooperate? No. We need to work together. In the Arab world, they have a nice saying, they say, you cannot clap with one hand. It should be taken into account. Emerging countries, emerging economies need strong partners and need even more, need strong partnerships. And the same applies for the entrepreneurs because opening the markets of the more developed countries might be overly expensive. But if companies, governments, entrepreneurs, innovators uh, get their hands together and build one strong network, then only sky is the limit because innovative potential of human brain is something that is unlimited. Let's try to explore and leverage. I see that there is the first question from uh, Renuga. So please, Renuga, go ahead with the question. We cannot hear. <clears throat> Never mind. Anyway, let me let me finish. Let me finish the, 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 the point we have started. So where is the future? The future is in connectivity, technology, building ecosystem for development of entrepreneurs building ecosystem to embrace and retain innovation and innovator, as we just discussed, and in building bridges, building networks and partnerships between the companies, individuals, governments, and end of the day, 
countries. If those pillars are at place, my firm belief is that the countries will thrive and go up. And another important aspect for both innovation, innovators and entrepreneurs is define the priorities. We cannot, we cannot run <clears throat> hundreds of races at the same time. Choose your races, choose your battles, and go for those <laughs> where you see not a quick win. Go for the battles where you see long-term growth. This leads to the success. This leads to sustainable success and long-term success. And this is what emerging countries, emerging economies, and entrepreneurs and innovators in those countries need. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, attention. Thanks for wonderful attendance. I see more than 200 people continuously on board. And it's a real privilege to be here and to present in such inspiring and uh, powerful environment. God bless you all. And uh, I am here at disposal for any comments, questions. And if you allow me, I will be happy to open the discussion. If anything comes to your mind, just send me an email, contact me, contact me on LinkedIn, wherever. I'm sort of very social guy, so I will happily respond to any question or point. And I am really and eagerly looking forward to seeing all of you together live as soon as possible, as soon as we get rid of those restrictions that are at the same time opportunities. But this we will discuss at some of the next sessions. Thank you once more. Thanks, Professor Sheila, for the invitation. God bless you. And once more, it's my pleasure and privilege. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Marco, for being with us. It's indeed been a great pleasure to have people from across the globe on this uh, platform and you are very special to us for inspiring us this day thanks so much thank you and god bless you sir sir there are a few questions please i'm at disposal yes sir so the first question is what is the best way for a country to increase entrepreneurship well, again, there is no one size fits all solution because growth of entrepreneurship is strongly associated with the culture. People very often make mistakes, especially international consultants. I had an opportunity and privilege to work as an international consultant for a while. You cannot take solution that works in, I don't know, for example, India and apply it to Costa Rica or to take solution that you have in Ghana and apply it in Serbia. It's impossible. So each and every country needs to set up its own entrepreneurship growth ecosystem. I can tell you example of Serbia taking into account elements of Serbian cultures. Serbs as a nation are very social, very active, very outspoken, very eager to, to work and uh, very committed to the success. You can see it from the sports. I mean, 7 million country that is having Novak Djokovic, that is superpower in a number of sports, starting from basketball or football, uh, handball, water polo, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so uh, Serbs love to succeed. And what is uh, the government? And that's part of the culture. Success is part of the culture. So what government understood? If you make pitches and competitions for entrepreneurs, they will grow, they will compete. So one element was to empower uh, and encourage entrepreneurs to compete between themselves and to win on different contests and competitions for technological best innovations, best developmental project, and so on and so forth. Another thing, which is general for all the countries, you need to regulate the framework. You need to create the framework. If there is no stability of the legal system, if laws can be interpreted in different ways, then it is difficult for entrepreneurs to grow and it is difficult to nurture the ecosystem. Because uh, 
entrepreneurship requires two important things to grow. Aside from innovation, aside from mindset, it requires stability and predictability. Those things are provided by development of proper framework. Framework means legal system that provides stability and additional governmental measures, incentives, subsidies, uh, and so on and so forth, tax holidays, whatever is at disposal, depending again from culture to culture, that will provide, and that the, uh, the entrepreneur knows that he or she can rely on the state support in this, that it's not a gamble to get the state support, that if it is written that they will get tax holiday, that they will really get tax holiday. So that sort of predictability that needs to be taken into account. I hope this answers your question a bit, but full answer to this question would require separate half an hour session. So I'm very happy to, to take it as a follow up. Yes, sir. Sir, another yes. question. One question for myself. No? Yes. Shall I ask? Yes, yes. So, um, how to start uh, an entrepreneurship or a business and how to be successful with our own idea, sir? Well, uh, first thing is to understand your very own idea. So, take the idea and analyze it 100%. Analyze it from different angles. So don't take one angle. The fact that I like something does not mean necessarily that I will be successful in doing that. So you need to analyze the idea from different aspects. That's step number one. Step number one, so to analyze, to study idea and to understand if there is really potential for the success. Potential for the success means that there is no huge competition or you are the most affordable on the market. Second, that uh, you are having uh, innovation in your hand. That's ideal thing. Third, that you can be competitive. Fourth, you can uh, produce uh, with the margin that is sufficient for you to earn enough. And fifth, last but not least, you can produce quickly enough to cover uh, the needs of the market. So if these elements are there, then we have really no need to to wait to proceed with our with our idea and then we can go to the next step next step is to understand what do you need in order to make your operations successful what are the people what are the resources what support do you need from again different stakeholders you may have in the process and once you round this then you can go and orient towards other aspects. Production, if we are talking about products, marketing, sales, and so on and so forth. Sometimes people forget to do steps one and two, forget to analyze their own idea, forget to analyze what do they need, forget to provide proper supply of all the needed required resources and are not fully realistic with themselves because you know, they embrace the idea that they start feel, to feel a sense of entitlement to the idea. What is legitimate? Again, we are human beings. We are not perfect. But we need to be objective towards our own idea. The first uh, step in building business success is to be realistic and objective towards the idea. So if idea is good, if idea can sustain the reality check of all these elements I have discussed, then there is high probability that with high, with high level of work, with proper support and with a bit of luck, which still you will need, and which still we all need, a bit of blessings from above, we will be successful. I hope this answers your question partly. Again, need separate session to answer it fully. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was a, such a wonderful session, sir. Thank you, Dr. Mahalakshmi. It was my utmost pleasure uh, 
Big, big thanks to everyone. God bless you all. Stay safe. And I hope we'll have another sessions like this in the near future. I'm at disposal. Yes, yes, yes. I extend my heart. Thanks for Mr. Marcus Lukovic. And it was a, such a thought provoking session, sir. And you were highlighting on the key elements of innovation and the importance of networking. And you are very patient in answering all our queries as well. And uh, we look forward for the future sessions as well, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, and God bless everyone. Thank you, Mr. Marco and Dr. Sureka. It was a very lively and energetic session. I now request Dr. Avila Jali to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Monica Gallen, to share her experiences on facilitating the entrepreneurial spirit in female students. Respected dignitaries, faculty, staff, and my dear students, very good afternoon to you all. I'm Dr. A. Avila Jolie, Assistant Professor, Department of Zoology of this college. Feel privileged and humble to take this opportunity to introduce our speaker. To be inspired is great, but to be an inspiration is a honor. Yes, our guest speaker of this- Can you please open your video? Can you please open your video, please? Yes. As you speak? Yeah. Yes. To be inspired is great, but to be an inspiration is a honor. Yes, our guest speaker of this session is one of such inspirer, Dr. Monica Gallen, Associate Professor in Accounting, Assistant Dean of Executive MBA Program, Dubai On Campus, and Middle East Online Jain School of Global Management, who will enlighten us on the topic facilitating the entrepreneurial spirit in female students and experiential approach. Ma'am is a qualified as a chartered accountant who hails from Canada with a master's degree in education technology and doctorate in education. She began her career at Deloitte as a senior auditor and then founded her passion for teaching as community college instructor. Dr. Monica has worked in the education sector in Dubai for 25 years. She was an associate dean of business at the Higher College of Technology and more recently as a president and CEO at the College of Fashion and Design and dean of ESMED French Fashion Institute Dubai. She enjoys bringing creativity, technology, and authentic learning experiences into the classroom and finding ways to actively engage her students. In addition to financial accounting, her research interests include intellectual intelligence, entrepreneurship, and women issue. Dr. Monica is a certified mentor, certified trainer for intellectual intelligence, Certified trainer for personality, dimension, and qualified site evaluator and mentor for the Accreditation Council of Business Schools and Programs. She has won Global Teaching Excellence Award as well as Research Excellence Award in her free time. Excellence Award. In her free time, she enjoys creating ceramic arts, sewing, quilting, yoga and communing with nature with her cocker spaniel. I thank her for accepting our invitation and find you as an optimistic choice to serve as a resource person in today's session. Please join me in welcoming our renowned speaker. Once again, I welcome each and everyone in this gathering. Thank you. It is over to our speaker, Dr. Monica Gallant. Ma'am, platform is yours. Thank you very much for that warm welcome. I'm going to try to share my uh, my my slides. Let's see if I can do that. Okay, are you able to see my slides at all? Not yet, ma'am. Okay. Mm -hmm.
Can you see them now? Is it is is there a there is a sharing option? Oh, here we go. Share. Hang on. Share your entire screen. Okay. Let me try once once again. There is an arrow upward. There's an arrow upward. And that's okay. the that's the present now mode. You got to go to the present now mode. Yeah, and then should I choose yeah. a window? Yeah, and or, then you choose oh. a window. Choose the window oh, okay. where your PPT is opened. There we go. Yeah. Can you see it now? Mm, not yet. That's a heavy. Ah, yeah, heavy. it's almost there. Yes. There we go. How about now? Yeah, and then yes. uh, you can click the full screen mode. Okay, can you see it now? Mm, full screen. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure why it's not uh, not showing. Can you see anything? You could stop presenting and do that again. All right, let's try again. The upward arrow present now and then you choose the screen like you did last time yes Can yeah that's fine now? yes fine but you could use the full screen option yeah trying that maybe the slideshow okay i did that let's try or again. the little icon near the <laughs> bottom yeah. Yeah, I'm trying. It doesn't seem to want to do that. Hang on, let me try it from another screen. There, okay, how's that? I think this can, is okay. If can you see it now? Awesome. I put it on full screen. Mm. No. No, I think you have to press that again. Okay, I'm not sure why it's not. Uh, as soon as I do it, it uh, there. Uh, this is this is fine. Is okay, this is fine. Is okay. okay. Let's fine. just go with this. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, David. I'm glad for your uh, your endorsement. Okay. Yeah. So, so let, let me go with this. I, I've tried to put it full yeah, screen. Yeah, that's not a problem. Good. You can okay. carry on. Yes, yeah, it's quite My font is quite large, so hopefully you'll be able to see it. Um, and hopefully it will move. It will move forward as well. Oh, maybe it's not going to move. Okay, let me... okay, can you see it now? Now I feel like I've lost everyone. Hello? Uh. It, it, it seems I can't move the slides forward. Uh. I'm going to try one more time. Hang on. Okay, I'm going to try a tab. Maybe that's different. No, that's no good. Ma'am, you can select entire window also, ma'am, if possible. Yeah, it didn't let me do that. Yes. Sorry, I'm just okay. Yes. I'm just going to go yes. ahead. Okay, yes. so hopefully you can all hear me. I can't seem to see you at the same time as I can see my presentation, and uh, yes, I can uh, move it forward. Anyway, um, thank you for coming to my presentation. I'm going to be talking about uh, a project that I did a few years back, which was uh, designed to create an entrepreneurial spirit in Emirati women. So this, uh, this was a, a very successful project that ran for more than 10 years. So I'm going to explain to you how we developed this, this project. 
So I, I don't need to introduce myself uh, very much, I don't think, because I was so well introduced. But I am living here in Dubai for the last 25 years. I'm currently uh, working at SP Jane, but this project was something I did when I was working at the Higher Colleges of Technology, which was uh, focused on educating Emirati women. Uh, are you able to see my slides as I move them forward? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, good, good. Okay, so, um, so a little bit about the context of where I ran this project. So it uh, was at a government-funded college for Emirati women, a very large college system. We had a very huge campus, very modern, 2,200 students. Um, we had a whole number of different programs, including business. The students' first language was Arabic, but we taught them in English. So a big part of our challenge was teaching the students English first and then uh, teaching them business concepts. We were very highly uh, technology enhanced and we focused on project-based learning. So we were really, the whole school was focused on um, experiential learning, which was, was really very exciting. Now, the challenge in trying to teach business to these Emirati girls was they didn't really have much of a background at all, no experiences. They were all um, 18 years and over, so they were, they were young adults, but they had not had any work experience. Some of them had very little uh, exposure outside their homes. So it was really difficult to try to teach them concepts like decision making, for example. So I would ask them, if you are going to make a decision, how would you go about doing it? And they really couldn't, couldn't think. Uh, they, they didn't have any uh, practical context to apply this. I would try to make it, um, you know, make it personal by saying, well, if you went shopping and you saw two dresses that you liked, how would you choose? And, and they would laugh and say, oh, we'd choose both of them. You know, or I, I'd say, how, would you, how did you choose to come to this college? And they'd say, well, my dad said I had to come here. So we really had some difficulties in finding uh, examples that we could use in the classroom to uh, make the, the, the course come alive. Uh, so we were thinking, what can we do? We need to put them in a situation where they have to make decisions, where they have to manage people, where they have to use critical thinking. So since they didn't have their own practical situation, we manufactured one. And that's how we, this project was born. Okay. And you can see it was some time ago. That's, that's me very long, long time ago. Uh, so our solution to this challenge was to create a, a business fair. So we actually said to the students, we want you to actually run a business, a real business, for three days in the college because that was a safe environment for them they weren't really allowed to go around the city and do things so we said we'll have a, a business fair in our college and you actually have to make money it's a real live uh, business fair and you're going to have to fund it yourself you're going to have to uh, to run the business yourself you're going to have to design everything so it was a huge project it took uh, the entire semester uh, and all of the year two courses were uh, integrated into the project. So every teacher had a part to play and all of the skills in marketing, management, economics, business communications and accounting were assessed also uh, in this project. So it was a very high stakes project for the students. They knew they had to really uh, do a good job on this. Okay. So uh, we started with our year two students. They were the, the, the entrepreneurs. Okay? So they were the ones who had to come up with the business idea. So we, we had brainstorming sessions in class. We put them in groups. They had to come up with different ideas and concepts, what things that would be appealing to their fellow um, students in, in the college. Um, and we, the very first time we did it, we just kept it with our year two students and we didn't involve others. But as uh, time went on, we started to expand. And one of the very fun innovations was including some employees. So our year two students, um, you know, we, we wanted to teach them managerial skills. But in order to be a manager, you need some employees to manage. 
So we decided that we would allocate some of our year one business students as employees for the year two uh, student businesses. Now, what was funny about this was initially uh, the year two students didn't want them. They, they told us, no, 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 we will do it ourselves. We don't want these employees. Um, and uh, and this was, this was um, surprising to us. And we said, why? Why don't you want these employees? Oh, they won't come on time. They won't work hard. They won't be motivated. And we said, brilliant. That's exactly what we want you to learn how to do as a manager. How will you motivate your employees? How will you incentivize them? How will you train them so they'll know what to do? And suddenly light bulbs were going off in their minds and they were like, oh, that's the job of a manager. And we're like, yes, this is what we're trying to train you to do. You have to learn how to manage other people. Uh, so of course, once that happened, then then uh, you know some of them did it very well, others not as well. Uh, and then, of course, the year one students the following year became the managers. So they then knew how they enjoyed being managed and how they didn't enjoy being managed in some cases. So we would tell them, like, look, you now know what it's like to be managed. Now you know uh, what you should do to be a better manager. Our year three students would be the advisors. So, so they would give advice to the younger students and they would also go around and help us choose uh, some awards for the best business or the best customer service or the most effective advertising campaign. So we had them uh, take the role of assessors as well. So we would start the whole project in the very first few weeks of the semester, and then it would run, as I said, all through the semester with various milestones that they would have to do. So they would start with doing some feasibility. Uh, they had to present their idea in a small business plan. They had to talk about the costs that would be involved and where they might get some, some financing. It was very, very small. Um, but in some cases, the students would say they don't really have any financing. Their families wouldn't um, you know, give them any, any loans. So then we talked about what sorts of businesses are cheaper to start versus which sort, sorts of businesses are more expensive. Or how can you negotiate with vendors to give you some credit? So, uh, you know, we, we again started their uh, thinking processes of different ways to solve a lack of finance type of problem. Um, we also wanted them to add some value. So not just uh, buy some products somewhere cheap and then just, just sell them for a higher price. Um, we wanted them to do something. So in some cases that was, um, you know, uh, customizing them, personalizing them, or maybe adding an interesting packaging or maybe gathering them together in, in a, you know, a different um, configuration. So taking soap and adding a soap dish or adding a, a, a washcloth and making it a package. You know, so they, they had a number of different ways to add value to their uh, product. Um, as I mentioned, they had to use their own money. So they had to go and seek the inventory. Uh, and, and you know, of course, they love shopping, so they, they enjoy doing this part. But trying to find uh, good suppliers, uh, often the students would start telling me at the very beginning that their strategy would be the best quality at the cheapest price. And I would just smile and say, well, you know, that's a nice theory, but in practice, how do you do that? The best quality doesn't normally come at the lowest price. You have to compromise on one or the other. So uh, they then saw that in action as they went out and went, oh, wait a minute, you know, this high quality item, um, people aren't going to pay a premium, an even more premium price for it. Uh, this low quality item is so low quality that um, you know, even at this cheap price, people won't, um, you know, won't, won't uh, purchase it. So uh, it, it was very interesting now that they actually saw it in practice that they had to um, change their strategy somewhat. In some cases, they were able to uh, negotiate goods on consignment with some suppliers to help with financing, which was, again, a, a concept that they had not been familiar with before uh, embarking on this project. They had to promote their business and the students ended up being very creative. They did all number of different things. You can see these two students here dressed up in costumes and went around and gave uh, flyers to people. Um, they, they did, uh, you know, uh, email, uh, 
uh, mail outs, they created websites, they did personal promotion, giving uh, free samples sometimes. Uh, the students really tried uh, any number of things to advertise their, their business. Um, then uh, when it came time to actually run the business fair, so it was a, a scheduled three days uh, project within the, in the semester, um, the college would provide a, um, a basic booth. So just uh, the structure, very, very basic structure with no decoration whatsoever. So the students then had to, uh, in this case, they had to source these refrigerators that they were using. They had to decorate the booth themselves. Uh, we did have some students who wanted to bring their housemaids or their family members to come and help uh, them do this. And we said, no, no, we want you to do this yourself. This is meant to be a, you know, a self-directed project. So here we saw students getting on ladders and, and cutting and pasting and painting and uh, really uh, showing their, their creativity um, on a tight budget. Occasionally, we had students who wanted to hire an interior decorator to come and do the booth decoration for them, um, but then they realized how expensive that was and decided that maybe it was better to do it themselves. Uh, as I mentioned, the students uh, were given a set of uh, employees from year one students, so they had to decide how they were going to deploy the students. Um, the, first, the first idea was to give them all the work that they didn't want to do, but of course that didn't go over very well. So uh, they needed to, to decide on delegation strategies. They had to do timetabling. The um, business fair ran uh, from the morning to the evening. So it would run typically from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. So uh, they realized that 12 hours was a long shift. So they then made shift schedules uh, and asked students to come and they tracked uh, their, their comings and goings to make sure they were following the, the time schedule. Uh, there, there was uh, performance assessments going both ways. So the year two students would evaluate the work of the year one students and uh, that feedback was given to their year one teacher to incorporate into their reflection so that all the students both in year one and two had to reflect on their experiences uh, and the year one students they also gave feedback on the behavior of the year two managers so how were they as a manager? Were they, um, you know, did they give us good guidance? Did they uh, treat us nicely? Uh, and then the year two students, they had to incorporate th that feedback into their report. And uh, this was also really eye-opening for some of these students. I remember one girl coming to me and uh, just shaking her head and saying, I don't understand why I didn't get a good feedback from my employees, where my, my friend, she got really great feedback. Now, both of these students, the, the managers, were A students. They were really clever, very, very high achievers. But the one girl, she was just like shaking her head. I, I don't understand it. You know, and it was quite funny because the, she was talking to me with, her, with the other girl. And she's like, yes, yes, you know this, this one student, you know that, that tall one with, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, was always wearing jeans, you know, um, what was her name again? And the other girl would go, oh, you mean Nora? Oh, yes, yes, her. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was always really nice to her. And then she said, yeah, that other one, that short one, you know, that one that was, uh, you know, often talking on her phone, you know, uh, what, what was her name again? And the other girl would go, oh, you, you mean uh, Mariam? Yes, yes, her. And then as we went, went on, I said, but you don't know the names of any of your employees? I said, you only had five. I said, you don't know their names. Your colleague knows all their names. Why do you think the students gave her a very high score as a manager and they gave you uh, a lower score as a manager? And suddenly she realized, she said, oh, yes, you're right. I really didn't connect with them. I, you know, I, I didn't shout at them, I didn't mistreat them, but I also didn't really get to know them. And she said, that's important as a manager, isn't it? And I'm like, well, you know, you, you see it for yourself. So those kind of learnings I, I felt were uh, priceless. Uh, how, how can you possibly tell someone that uh, just by saying, you know, it's important to know your employees until you actually experience it. And then she realized like, oh yeah, you know, I can see why that's important. 
uh, it ran over three days. It was a great opportunity for the entire college to, um, to market itself. So we would invite school kids, like small children, they would come, we had special activities for them. Um, all the students would invite their family and friends and they had large families and friends. So we would have, uh, you know, they, because they, they, they invited them because they were proud of their own work, but also uh, because they wanted more customers. <laughs> so they said, we need people to buy our products. We need to invite more people. So they invited as many people as, as they could. So our campus had a, a, had a sort of an open day environment with all these community people coming through. Um, and the, the, the students had to, to manage, like, you know, some of them were, were selling food, for example, so they had to manage the inventory, they had to predict the sales, they were handling cash, uh, you know, keeping track of, of uh, you know, of sales, creating invoices. Uh, so all of the things that go into running a small business, they were actually doing. Uh, of course, there, there were um, problems. I mean, sometimes we, we, I mean, we didn't create the problems, but the problems created amazing learning experiences. So if you're familiar with Dubai, normally we don't have much rain. It's, it's normally very nice weather. We would typically have this event at the end of November, early December. So it was usually quite a good time of year. The weather was not too hot, but um, from time to time, we would get a big rainstorm, and then suddenly, you know, uh, there were all number of problems, and the students were just amazing. They they would do everything to to make it work, um, and it really again gave them real life experiences of how to handle a crisis situation. Uh, we had students from other majors at our campus. So we had, um, for example, in this picture, you can see some of our um, health sciences students. So other um, departments would, would uh, initially, I think they were a, a bit envious of the excitement that was created by the business department. So uh, they then jumped on the bandwagon and decided to have their own activities during this time because as I mentioned, it was like an open day for the community to come. So they would uh, think of their own uh, sort of entrepreneurial activities. They may not have been profit oriented, but uh, certainly they would set up uh, different kinds of activities that suited their major. So for example, the health sciences students set up a health check and medical screening. And so they, they set up a, 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 you know, sort of a site where people could go and, and uh, have their blood pressure checked or have some, um, uh, you know, uh, blood sugar checking and this type of thing. The journalism students, they would go around and act as reporters and uh, take videos and take interviews and write uh, stories about uh, all of the activities that were going on. So we, we tried to involve the entire campus. Uh, they couldn't really help but be involved because uh, the buzz was so uh, big happening on the campus that they really couldn't miss it. But it was uh, it was quite fun. Uh, in this picture, you can see Sheikh Nahen. He was at that time the Minister of Education. Uh, so he um, was also very proud of our students. So he would come through and uh, talk to the students. And uh, you can see here some of the students were a bit shy, uh, but they, they uh, really were thrilled if the uh, the sheikh came and spoke to them um, and we had any number of different uh, business people coming through uh, the business fair to admire what the the work of the students uh, the we had we also had an education department they put on special activities for young children uh, so they would come and and uh, this is one of our education students dressed as a clown here uh, giving some special um, activities for young children who also could um, of course, wander through and be inspired by the um, entrepreneurial activities of uh, the rest of the, the, uh, the students. Um, we also tried to encourage uh, corporate social responsibility. So we instituted a very novel idea uh, and we had bizarre, it was called bizarre at one time or business fair, um, currency. So, so what happened here was if you wanted to spend at the business fair, instead of just spending dirhams, you had to spend these special um, business fair dows, we called them. There was a special kind of money. And uh, so you would take your actual dirhams to the bank 
which was run by our financial services students. And they would exchange uh, your actual dirhams for um, money that you could spend at, at the business fair. And then when that money was then brought back by the businesses to convert it back into dirhams, they would take 5%. So it was basically a 5% sales tax, if you will, but we uh, managed it like an exchange rate. So uh, this was great experience for the finance students, but it also was uh, an opportunity for us to collect up some uh, revenues that were then donated to charity. So people felt that if they uh, were you know, purchasing at, at, at the business fair, they were also giving a small, small donation to charity. Uh, when the, uh, the whole event was over, uh, the learning was, was not over, then the students had to write a comprehensive report. So they had to go through the whole experience, reflect what, on what went well, what didn't go well, did they achieve their goals, did they not achieve their goals, why did they, why didn't they, um, if they didn't make money, you know, why was that? Uh, it, they certainly weren't graded on whether they made money or not. It was more about their critical thinking. You know, were they able to actually articulate what didn't work well? What would they do differently if they were going to do it all again? Um, you know, was there some you know additional competition that they hadn't anticipated? Did they set their prices at the wrong level? Uh, you know, what actually um, you know caused uh, the business to fail or caused the business to succeed? Um, so they had to present their learning uh, in a written format as well as in an oral format to a panel of their teachers and different teachers, again, were looking at different aspects of the project. So the marketing teachers would look at their marketing efforts, the financial accounting teachers would look at their uh, control of finances and so on. So uh, they ended with a, with a wonderful report. Um, some of the long-term outcomes, um, we, we, had, we brought back some of our alumni to actually set up small booths in, in the business fair to show that uh, you, you can go on to be an entrepreneur. And of course, many of our students who experienced the business fair uh, realized that they enjoyed this so much that they did want to go on and become an entrepreneur, um, not necessarily using the business model that they had uh, used in the fair, uh, because that was a very um, limited uh, audience, uh, target audience of customers, but just the idea of being an entrepreneur, of, of the excitement of setting up your own business, of going through all those steps, really encouraged that entrepreneurial flair. So uh, we did have many students who came back later to say that they've now opened up uh, their own um, startup of some sort. Um, and, and often they would attribute the, uh, the start of that, the, the seed was planted in, in this event. All right, so um, I'm going to try and see everybody again because at the moment I can't see anyone's faces. So there we go. Uh, so, so that was our project in a nutshell. Uh, it was really a wonderful um, experience, great fun for everyone involved. It was kind of a highlight of the semester for our, our students and for the teachers. Um, I'm now happy to answer any, any questions that, that you might have. Yes, ma'am. There are a few questions, ma'am. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, what do you think is the biggest weakness in female entrepreneurs? Uh, okay. Um, I, I think sometimes uh, lack of confidence, uh, fear of failing. So, uh, you know, that, that, um, that they just sometimes there's a, a, a preconceived notion, stereotypical notion that entrepreneurship is not for women. It uh, should be for, for men. Um, so I think overcoming that and, and sort of highlighting uh, women role models, um, encouraging women to take chances, to take risks at an early stage in life will help them to um, become more confident. Yes, thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, uh, hi, question. Yeah, go ahead, Annie. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, so when it comes to marketing, uh, can you uh, tell me what should I do for my uh, small business and how do I market for my business? Um, well, that's a whole other topic, um, but it depends very much on... Um, 
what sort of business you have, what your target audience is. I think um, Marco in the previous presentation was talking a bit about this, that you first have to decide what is your uh, com competitive advantage. So what, you know, what, what is your business offering that is different than others? Then you have to focus on creating that message, deciding on who is your target market, who are the most likely customers to uh, enjoy your business, and then how to reach them. Uh, you know, is it best to reach them online, on which platforms, um, what sort of messages would, would appeal to them, um, you know, and, and then you have to design a, a, a strategy accordingly. Uh, then, uh, ma'am, I have another one question. Uh, how do beginners do marketing, ma'am? How do beginners do marketing? In, uh, uh, in a small business? It's, I, it's, I think, yeah. So, again, I think you have to follow the advice I just gave, that you have to think about your first start with your competitive advantage, then, then decide on your target audience, and then decide how to reach them. Uh, and then a key part of that is also your budget. So how much money do you have available to spend on this advertising? Um, uh, oftentimes you need you have very little budget <laughs> or none. So then you have to think about ways to uh, generate uh, a following using social media, for example, um, maybe using influencers, uh, that can be a way to do it. Um, you know, it's, it, it all depends on the type of business. Any yes. other questions? Yes, thank you, ma'am. There's one more question. Yeah, go ahead. And there was one more question, ma'am. Uh, how? What are the tips you would suggest us to face or tolerate the failures or opportunity negligence? What are the tips you will give us to face? Tips to avoid failure. Failure. Yes, ma'am. Uh, research. So start by by doing your homework first. Um, taking advice from lots of people. One of the the, the uh, biggest failings of entrepreneurs is thinking they can do it all themselves, uh, thinking they know better than everyone else. So it's good to have confidence and passion, but it's also really important to seek out um, expert advice from from others. Um, you know. Don't be afraid to share your ideas with many people um, and see what, what they suggest and what um, you know, um, tips they give you. Uh, so, I, so I think having, having advice from many people, um, listening, um, starting, maybe starting small and building and testing and taking feedback from customers, um, I think those are all very, very important. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. A last question, ma'am. One more question. How do how to get rid of gender inequality in the society to raise as a big boss in their business? <laughs> well, I wish there was a magic answer for that one. That's a that's a million dollar question. Um, I I think uh, it starts very young. I mean, I don't know if uh, you know how many uh, women and men we have in our audience, but I think it starts right from childhood, uh, raising children um, to 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 take choices, make decisions, um, raising both male and female children to respect both genders. Um, letting our girls have their their options uh, of what sort of things they would like to study encouraging them to to um to, to do small small business endeavors um you know i think i think it, it has to begin when we raise our children yes thank you so much ma'am for patiently answering all our queries thank you so much ma'am thank you ma'am for for an enlightening and wonderful presentation on entrepreneurial activities in emirated girls and transforming them to one successful entrepreneur. I thank you from my bottom of the heart for taking time from your busy schedule to be a guest speaker of this seminar. Your presence and wise words help magnify our cause in a best possible way.
Thank you so much, ma'am, for delivering us a, such a remarkable presentation. I owe to you a special vote of thanks for being here. Thank you once again, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. And if anyone wants to know anything more about this uh, topic, please feel free to email me. Okay, take care. Have a wonderful Thank day. you, Monica. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless you. Okay. You too. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Monica, and thank you, Dr. Avila. I hope our students would have got a lot of ideas from your on-campus experiences. May I now request Ms. Jasmine to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Smuggle, to share his insights on PV technology and applications. Over to you, Dr. Avila. Dr. Jasmine, are you there, Jasmine? Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Yeah. Please open your uh, video and you can start. A warm good afternoon to one and all gathered online for the 18th invited lecture of TRICE 2021. Let me start addressing this online gathering with a quote, gaining knowledge is the first step to wisdom. Sharing it is the first step to humanity. To witness it, we are gathered here for the International Virtual Conference on Transdisciplinary Research and Innovation for Entrepreneurship and Sustainability 2021. I feel elated to welcome and introduce Dr. Smagel Karajanov, Senior Researcher in the Solar Energy Department, Institute for Energy Technology, Norway. Dr. Smagel received his PhD in the year 1993 from the Institute of Physics and Technology, Tashkent, Uzbekistan. Presently, he serves as a senior researcher in the Department of Solar Energy at Norway and works as a professor at the National Research Nuclear University, Moscow, Russia Federation. Dr. Smagel has supervised five postdocs, seven PhDs, and 12 master grads of the Solar Energy Department in the Institute for Energy Technology, Norway. He had been as a guest editor for four topical issues of the Elsevier journal Materials Letters guest editor of the Elsevier journal Solar Energy for the special issue on third and fourth generation solar cells. His other commission of trust includes scientific advisory board on chromogenic materials and devices in the Delft University of Technology, the Netherlands, and scientific advisory board on 5G solar project at the Tallinn University of Technology, Tallinn, Estonia. His research interests are materials development for smart window applications, emerging solar cell concepts, advanced materials for solar cell and smart window applications, synthesis and characterization of composite nanoparticles for wastewater treatment, superhydrophobic and mechanically strong flames, theoretical study of materials by first principles calculations. Dr. Smuggle has published more than 100 journals, two patents, and has done a lot of conference presentations, including invited talk at EMRS and invited lectures at other international events. He has been the chairman for many user-oriented disseminations, to name a few of them, for the Winter School on Materials for Energy and Environmental Technologies, in the National Research Nuclear University, Moscow, Russia, and Summer School on Nanomaterials for Energy and Environmental Applications, Madrid, Spain. He also acts as an international coordinator for Madurai Kamaraj University International Conferences and other conferences in Tamil Nadu, India since 2013. I'm very much delighted to welcome such an accomplished person to deliver the lecture on PV technology and its applications. Now I invite Dr. Smuggle to take over this online session.
Dr. Smagul, please unmute your audio. We are unable to hear you, sir. Okay. Yes. Uh, so it uh, gives me great pleasure to deliver this talk uh, in your audience. And uh, thanks for a very nice uh, introduction. <clears throat> and uh, today uh, I would like to, uh, to tell uh, about uh, photovoltaic technology and uh, its uh, applications. And yesterday uh, I did the sharing of my screen, but uh, now I'm unable to do it. I don't know why what happened. Do you see my screen, my presentation? Yes, sir. I can see your presentation. It yes. is in slides, uh, slideshow. Yes. Yeah. Now it is perfect. <clears throat> yes. So, um, Institute for Energy Technology, this is uh, where I'm working. We call it IFE or IFE. This is one of the unique institutions in Norway that has focused uh, research and that research is related to energy. Here, we are working with wind energy, solar energy, petroleum energy, and um, energy storage materials and devices, hydrogen storage, hydrogen energy, blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, and environmental technology also. And lithium ion batteries, for example, sodium ion batteries, and uh, uh, there are uh, more than uh, 600 employees in IFE. This is International Institute. About 10% of uh, all the staff of the institution uh, are from international community from different countries uh, in the world. So this uh, talk is about photovoltaic system. And uh, first I started uh, from uh, price for the uh, photovoltaic technology. There are the two today many PV technology is there. What stands for photovoltaic technology? This is a technology for developing uh, devices, equipments that converts sunlight into electrical energy. And to today, there are four uh, uh, generations of that uh, technology. And each of uh, these generations uh, include um, it's, uh, plenty of varieties of solar cell designs and uh, materials. And the price for the solar cells of the PV technology is uh, reducing from year to year. However, uh, this is dependent on market. For example, now silicon-based solar cell uh, with the durability of about 25 years, 30 years, and uh, the price is uh, about 10 cents of US dollars uh, per watt. If we consider multi-junction solar cells, uh, they have very high efficiency and very durable, but they are very expensive. 250 US dollars per watt. And this technology uh, is uh, used mainly for cosmic space. They are radiation tolerant, whereas silicon is not. And uh, as I said, uh, the price here, uh, it depends on material on market. And uh, in the price estimation, there are uh, a few issues. One issue is, uh, as I said, it's the materials price, which is dependent on market. And as you know, uh, there is no trade war between China and the US and the relationship with Europe is not also good. And, uh, because, and the most of the materials used in PV technology is coming from China. So then the price can be somehow influenced and regulated. And 40% uh, of palladium, for example, is coming from Russian Federation. And from 2009, they are reducing uh, and the, the palladium to, to, to bring it to the world market. And the same situation is ongoing on materials and as a result of these um, uh, uh, issues, and each and every country, they are looking for now uh, materials in their own place. <clears throat> and so uh, you can see in this picture, reducing the price. And in the last years, uh, there is some tendency for increasing. So this is what stands for materials price. And uh, also another issue is environmental issue. One thing is when we develop these uh, photovoltaic devices in the laboratory, derive its price and efficiency, but when it comes to concrete applications, then we see um, 
uh, strong dependence of this performance of the devices in concrete environmental condition. Uh, for example, if one uh, builds um, builds a solar electric station, photoelectric station in Sahara, or for example in the former Aral Sea region in Uzbekistan, there are dust storms. When it comes to like a few photovoltaic modules, no problem, and just one person can clean uh, every day based. Okay. However, if these panels are installed on uh, several kilometer square region, cleaning will become suddenly an issue. And then one should hire a person and pay salary for cleaning or develop additional technology uh, to, to develop anti-soiling coatings. And uh, all these will add, uh, contribute to price of the energy generated by photovoltaic technology. And in addition, there is one more factor that is not accounted for in the price, uh, which is recycling. So there are some challenges uh, related to energy, <coughs> renewable energy and its applications. And I, one of the factors, as I mentioned, it's the influence of climate conditions, wind movement, temperature, irradiation, air pollution, snow, volcano, humidity, and so forth, sandy area, industrial area. Uh, so all these issues are playing big role nowadays in uh, applications of um, uh, renewable energy technologies, and in particular in uh, solar energy technology. And uh, you, uh, so, but um, these issues are not stopping uh, uh, nobody. And uh, uh, now you know this uh, fourth industrial revolution, which considers utilization of um, uh, renewable energy uh, in the industry, in countries as well. There are a lot of examples. For example, uh, there is agreement between Norwegian energy companies, Statkraft, and the auto concern of Daimler AG in Germany. And so that about three automobile companies uh, will use renewables uh, from 2022. And also nowadays, um, uh, the engines uh, of the cars, okay? And uh, none of the companies, uh, car producing companies, are investing for developing the engines that will get fuel from diesel. In Germany, trains uh, will be converted to hydrogen and uh, hydrogen fuel cars. And uh, so a lot of challenges are ongoing. So to today, except renewable energy, solar energy, hydrogen energy, and uh, hydrogen energetics is uh, uh, one of the very important uh, issues uh, and uh, one of the very important topics for scientific research. And there is another uh, emerging topic called artificial photosynthesis that will um, uh, split water molecules uh, into hydrogen and oxygen. And so that the hydrogen will be reacting with CO2 gas and converted to fuel like uh, methane, methanol, ethanol, which are uh, much more safe than uh, uh, hydrogen. Because uh, if one gets hydrogen, one needs to transport it, okay? How to transport it? Through pipes. Common pipes don't suit for that purpose. It's suitable for transporting gas and oil, but not for hydrogen. Because hydrogen can react with metal and crack it. And uh, so the how to transport, this is a very important question. Then uh, except uh, uh, transporting also, uh, another uh, issue is um, uh, how to store it and the compressors are needed and so forth. There are a lot of challenges related to hydrogen energy and to the uh, other uh, uh, artificial photosynthesis related uh, uh, issues also. <coughs> yes, uh, as I said, uh, there are four generations of solar cells. Each of them include many varieties of solar cells. In the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, they have developed efficiency map. How efficiency for each type of the solar cell is um, moving, okay, uh, improving from year to year. 
And uh, so among them, the winner here is uh, the solar cells, multi-junction solar cells, based upon 3-5 compounds. They are very stable, they are high efficiency and radiation tolerant, mostly used in cosmic space and in concentrated, um, uh, concentrated sunlight cases. Efficiency is high, but price is super high, 250 US dollars per watt. And as to silicon, it's not as high as uh, multi-junction cells. Uh, its efficiency is around 28%, which is very close to th theoretically predicted limit of 31.5%. Uh, uh, but uh, this is very cheap technology, 0.1 EV. But uh, even the silicon uh, uh, has problems to satisfy energy demand of uh, human being in the world. Uh, for example, if uh, the technology is produced in uh, Europe, this is very expensive. Manpower is very expensive. If it's produced in China or Africa, then how to bring the technology? Transportation is very expensive. And the uh, installation and maintenance cost is very expensive. If one wants to produce it in Africa, for example, then one needs a well-developed uh, high-quality infrastructure, which is not available there. And if one even brings there that technology and build some plants there, one needs trained manpower, which is not available again in the local place. And how to transport that technology, for example, from Europe to Africa or Latin America. So there are some issues. And uh, the efficiency... Hello? Do you hear me? Yes, doctor, you can proceed. Okay, yes. We can hear you. Okay. And so, uh, the, 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 there are emerging solar cell technologies uh, based on tandem cells. The efficiency is uh, very good. Uh, it's coming, uh, it's uh, already over 28%. Disensitized solar cells are doing very well. In case of disensitized solar cells and the perovskite solar cells, they don't need uh, high technology like silicon. And uh, whereas efficiency is almost the same as silicon, okay? And uh, so because of that, uh, these uh, second and the, th and the third generation solar cells are uh, becoming very uh, big players. And uh, uh, solar cells uh, itself, they uh, cannot uh, be uh, implemented for installation. They have to be collected into modules. And the module efficiency is different than solar cell efficiency. If solar cell efficiency is about 28%, module efficiency will be around 20%. So in case of silicon solar cells, silicon-based solar modules, efficiency is slightly exceeds 20%. And there are thin film solar cells based on CIGS, cadmium telluride, for example. Their efficiency is much larger than silicon. However, production cost of all those cells is quite low. And for example, to today, there are different technologies are available for producing the CIGS uh, silicon module, oh, CIGS uh, solar module. And uh, one can start from substrate, and uh, after all these steps, at the end, they can get the module, which is not, uh, which uh, cannot be done in case of silicon solar cells. So let's have a look then, uh, 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 just uh, to design of the solar cell, how it looks like. So one needs to have silicon and uh, to make emitter. For emitter, one needs, uh, so this base layer, the wafer, it should have certain electrical conductivity. So suppose it has p-type conductivity. Then a uh, principle of operation, principle of conversion of sunlight in silicon solar cells, it's based on pin junction. We need P injunction, and we should create an emit uh, processing uh, in type electrical conductivity. And on top of the emitter, there should be passivation layers. Why passivation layers are needed? Because the outermost silicon atoms, they don't have, they, they have some dangling bonds not connected to uh, any atoms. And those atoms will connect to uh, atoms from environment uh, to different gases and that those will create a combination center for free electrons and holes. So when we illuminate it from this front side, 
electrons are holes and generated and they will all die at the interface states. To prevent it, we have to encapsulate it. And that encapsulating layer is called passivation layer. Role of this passivation layer is to reduce charge carrier recombination at the surface. Then on top there will be silver contacts. And from bottom, one can prepare aluminum contact. Uh, this is uh, called the back contact. Okay. Okay. Then if we have a look to this solar cell from the top, then we will see these type of very thin uh, parallel lines and uh, very thick uh, and vertical lines. And these vertical lines are called bus bars. And the very thin parallel lines, they are called uh, fingers. Okay. So, and here I would like to mention the following. Uh, these uh, yellow lines are uh, made of uh, silver and uh, their thickness, their widths, all is optimized. The distance between them must be optimized and for silicon solar cell technology, it's already developed. And nowadays even, uh, uh, yeah, this is example of the solar cell that has three bus bars. And then nowadays, uh, companies are producing multi bus bar cells. Initially, they uh, converted this technology to five bus bar cells and afterwards they move to nine bus bar cells and nowadays they are moving to multi bus bar cells and in some big producers uh, of uh, solar cells it, it's very hard to find even in the storage room five bus bar cells and uh, then uh, when solar cell is developed one must connect it in series or in parallel when the cells are connected in series then electrical current is constant then bus bar of one solar cell is connected to back contact of the other cell and electrical current is constant. And whereas voltages are added, if the solar cells are connected in parallel to each other, then voltage uh, others are constant and electrical current will be added to each other. In this way, uh, uh, one can get a module. In one module contains, uh, 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 it depends on uh, what voltage, what uh, watt, and what current uh, customer needs. Depending on that, uh, one uh, module can contain 36 solar cells, 64 or 72. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, then uh, uh, suppose we have the module, then the power of the module uh, it's not enough for customers, then these modules should be connected to each other as well, in series and in parallel. Yes, so th this is the example of the uh, like uh, parallel and uh, uh, series connections of the modules. By this way, at the end, customer will get uh, uh, whatever uh, and uh, total power, uh, total volt and the ampere they would like uh, to have. Uh, then uh, let's have a look how the module is made, okay? Uh, and uh, as you see in the picture on the left, these solar cells are connected to each other. As we said, they can be connected to each other. Dr. Smarko? We can't hear you, doctor. Can you unmute your audio, please? Oh. Now it is so, okay, doctor. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when it happened, uh, when you did not hear me? Just now. Only a fraction okay, of a second. Okay, yes. Thank you for noticing. Yes. So this is how the solar cells are made. And why we need this glass. Glass is needed for protection of the solar cell. Because uh, the silicon, it's commonly brittle. So uh, then uh, also there are some environmental factors. As you see uh, on the right hand side in the picture, there will be birds sitting on it and or some animals just jumping. So some protection is needed that can be glass. And there are a lot of requirements to glass also because transparency of the glass is about 92%, which is not enough. Some part of the solar energy will be blocked. 
And then the community to today needs lightweight material, which has larger transparency than glass. Um, so this uh, uh, search is under development still. There is uh, then also one uh, for the module, its weight is about 15.2 kilo, okay? And among them, the uh, half part uh, belongs to glass. So lightweight material of high transparency is a big uh, problem. Also, uh, I mean, the, to today, except and no other material was able uh, 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 to, to exhibit better performance in glass. Then also as to encapsulants, uh, polymers are used, but polymers are also very dangerous. They use, uh, they can be melted uh, when temperature is, uh, I mean, uh, at high temperature at high temperatures. So I want here to come back to this picture again. And suppose uh, a bird was sitting on top of a solar cell, okay? And then here that the solar cell uh, will be exhibiting very small electrical current because it's shadowed, whereas the other solar cells are not shadowed. And electrical current here should be equal to each other. And it means that one should use bypass lights Otherwise, if not bypass diodes, then it might happen that uh, this uh, solar cell that has been shadowed will be heated up. Uh, so huge current was uh, flowing through it. And then uh, these uh, 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 encapsulants made from polymer, they can be melted that, and the solar panel, uh, solar module can be out of order. So uh, to avoid it, uh, it's better to use uh, inorganic material or polymer, but um, uh, that can withstand uh, high temperature. So module performance uh, can be characterized by this uh, uh, mathematical formula, and uh, one should know number Do of solar cells. Dr. Smagel, sorry to interrupt. Can you put it in full screen? Oh, Is okay, it a okay. slide show? Yeah, 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 okay. Yes. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. One should just know here a uh, number of uh, solar cells connected in parallel and in series. And by this formula, one can estimate module performance. To today, there are uh, different types of module designs are available. Standard PV modules and the paving, tiling, a half cut design. Half cut design has been developed by Norwegian company, uh, Renewable Energy Corporation, REC, and the shingle design. And uh, we are making in our lab a shingle uh, uh, solar panels. And also bifacial modules are available as well. That will work from illumination from both sides. And for example, in case of utilization of the PV panels in Arctic region or Northern regions, uh, this technology will be important because there will be always snow on the on the earth and then uh, the reflected light uh, uh, and will also contribute uh, to uh, efficiency of the tv module as you know nowadays building integrated photovoltaics is very popular and uh, uh, the market uh, requires that um, we should be able to tune color of the tv modules in some places, it's like uh, all the buildings have bluish color. In some places, it's just white color. So then, uh, uh, depending on what community wants, uh, we should be able to tune its color, okay? And the color change can be possible by uh, changing uh, thickness of anti-reflection coating or by changing the color of the glass itself. Then the question is uh, when the efficiency loss will happen and uh, uh, in which case efficiency loss is too huge. Uh, so uh, this anti-reflection coating, uh, this, um, uh, uh, it can be a passivation layer as well. And uh, one can use multifunctional material that can be both anti-reflecting and passivating the surface. Uh, so this is example of silicon, okay? So this is multi-crystalline silicon. Um, and uh, after processing, uh, one can reduce uh, its light reflection. And after one makes a solar cell, then its color is totally different from gray color to blue color. But one can make uh, green color, pink color also. 
It depends on thickness of the uh, anti-reflection coating or passivation layer. So then if we talk about um, applications, the application area of PV technology is very broad. One of the examples is fish farm integrated photovoltaics. For example, in some regions, water is very warm, like uh, for example, in China, okay? And, but uh, people, community would like to eat uh, some fishes that lives in cold area. Then what to do? By using PV technology, this water, which is underneath the uh, water resource, uh, can be just circulated by PV technology. The cold water from bottom will be brought to up and so forth. And the other uh, technology, uh, which is popular nowadays, is um, uh, pumping the underground water. And however, the underground water, and this is uh, for fish farms, um, uh, mostly in dry areas. If uh, PV technology pumps water, then uh, oxygen amount in the water is lower than common, uh, common water. And uh, then that should, be, uh, uh, that should be fixed. And also the water, used water should be cleaned and processed it for that uh, PV energy is used. Of course, here there is another very like negative issue. Uh, the using the underground water, uh, you know, and it should be also controlled very well. And uh, it should be estimated how dangerous is it um, to the environment. <clears throat> it can be used in mobile shop uh, integrated PV. Uh, this is quite a simple example. And the road integrated PV can be, and the road infrastructure can be used uh, for installing the PV technology. And, and the nowadays, vehicle integrated uh, uh, PV technology is also well developed. That accounts for all these uh, peculiarities of the road condition. And uh, nowadays, aircraft integrated photovoltaic technology is uh, uh, used. For example, now there are a lot of expedition to Mars and uh, now expedition to Jupiter is planned even. And uh, where to get the energy? The energy will be getting uh, taken from solar and the PV panels uh, will be uh, powering these uh, flights and uh, these expeditions. And one of the last examples is uh, artificial photosynthesis. Uh, so here CO2 is needed and uh, uh, also uh, uh, it's, uh, you might know about photoelectrochemical solar cell, okay? And the, the photoelectrochemical solar cell on the influence of sunlight uh, splits water molecule into hydrogen and oxygen and then that hydrogen will react with CO2 and one can get fuel. This topic is now very popular. And um, how then PV technology can be here important? PV technology and uh, solar cells will be mounted to counter electrode side. Counter electrode here uh, is the platinum mostly, which is electrochemically very stable material. And uh, that, but it is very expensive, of course. So search of the platinum free or platinum reduced uh, uh, content in the photoelectric chemical cell is another very important problem. Just that this solar cell will be mounted uh, to you know, the platinum electrode. It can be done uh, very simply. For example, uh, in the silicon solar cell back contact is made of uh, aluminum. Just the platinum should be deposited on top of it and then the solar cell it should be sealed very well because it will work in uh, new environmental conditions uh, so then uh, in this case uh, this uh, voltage uh, corresponding to cathode can be controlled as a result uh, one can control the fuel that we are getting uh, from the photoelectric chemical cell and its efficiency can be enhanced because in the artificial photosynthesis the efficiency of photoelectric chemical solar cell path is very important. Also, uh, the water molecules can be split by electrolysis as well, which is uh, also another uh, good point. But uh, in Norway, by the way, now a hydrogen uh, uh, energy strategy is developed in Germany, in many European countries, in Netherlands, in um, you know, Portugal, for example, in Russia, 
they all have the uh, hydrogen uh, strategy. And uh, in the Germany's strategy, so they are um, putting main effort to electrolysis. However, uh, these reactors will get uh, power from renewable energy in floating photovoltaic technology on terrestrial. And uh, so all this will, would be uh, uh, fueling the photoelectrochemical solar cells to get the hydrogen. So, yes, and now I would like to talk about challenges related to um, uh, using the photovoltaic technology. One is degradation of the solar cells because of the different temperature. And when temperature increases, uh, silicon solar cell efficiency goes down. It's reduced. This is a big problem. Also, it depends on intensity of sunlight, intensity of illumination. The smaller the illumination, the smaller is the power that we will be getting. And even, uh, and also temperature plays a role. Then when it's 25 degrees C, it's okay. Then one can get uh, more than 200 watt energy. And however, if temperature increases to 55 degrees C, then efficiency goes down. It suddenly becomes about 180 uh, watt, which is, um, I mean, uh, this reduction is drastical. And the such temperature increase can happen in Sahara, in uh, many other places, and the temperature is very really high there. So, and there are some uh, ongoing work as to how to reduce temperature of silicon, how to control it. And uh, there are some, a lot of uh, fascinating ideas uh, uh, for that. One of them is uh, controlling the um, emission from uh, from the solar cell. For that, uh, bio-inspired polymer surface is considered. And for example, there are some uh, insects, ants living in Sahara with very high temperature, but these insects are surviving somehow. When uh, the surface of the skin was uh, tested, then they found it's uh, 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 texturized. And such a texturization technology is already available in silicon. Uh, by chemical processing, and one can make texturization of any size. Uh, so, yes, and by this way, uh, the community is hoping maybe it will be possible uh, uh, to control temperature. But of course, uh, one of the issues is uh, cooling with water. But then, if it's in Sahara, or uh, then where to get water? Water is itself um, like uh, an issue. And also another issue is dust. When it's too dusty, then, uh, uh, for example, if we send expedition to Mars, okay, and uh, where, when all these equipments are getting uh, uh, electrical energy from PV panels, so who will clean it then? Then uh, some cleaning technology must be developed. And also the protecting layer, for example, glass, it should uh, have a certain uh, like uh, coatings that will repel the dust and uh, then cleaning would be for example by wiping relatively easier so one of the technologies uh, developed is um, uh, I mean not technologies developed its uh, ideas was that let's texturize the surface of the glass to make a regular structure that will increase hydrophobicity and uh, then one can control on the, I mean, uh, soiling properties also. Uh, but then one should study uh, physical and chemical properties of dust as well. For example, uh, and uh, in the dust, in case of dust, the uh, shape can be totally different. If, for example, one makes this type of structure and just uh, the dust can come into it and stay there and uh, it will be very hard to withdraw it from there. So this is uh, quite challenging. For example, if this type of dust happens, then I think it's within one day, it will be totally dirty. And then uh, if, uh, for example, those dusts will come inside nanostructures, then uh, one cannot clean it at all. And uh, one should just throw it away. So environmental effect here is playing a very big role. We did it, such a study for pre aral region of Uzbekistan. And uh, here there was uh, RLC that was uh, dried out, okay? And then the wind coming from the north, it was lifting the dust. 
and this is a, a picture taken from Cosmos. And then uh, uh, that will totally uh, 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 make dirty the PV panels installed in this region. And there are about the 10 places where these PV electrostations are installed, so they will get just easily dirty. Then one should know what is content, because if it's uh, from the bottom of the sea, there should be a lot of salts as well. So these are the composition of the bus that we have uh, installed, that we have uh, examined. And uh, we did the study uh, for uh, in the multi-floor building on the third floor and on the terrestrial case uh, on the earth, just one meter from the earth's surface and in a village uh, on off of a um, uh, house. So then uh, also it's, it was done for uh, within, uh, for example, three months time to one year here in the picture, just a mess collection uh, of the dust. Uh, it was changing from uh, timing, okay? And uh, then, uh, yes, uh, okay. So this is, um, uh, for example, one of the examples when it's dust storm in the pre aral region and uh, then PV panels can get easily dirty and efficiency and in the laboratory conditions, one can expect efficiency of 28%, but it can be within one day, 5% or 0%. So, and uh, this is content of the uh, air, and the such study should be done for each region where these PV installations will be ongoing. Uh, and uh, because of the uh, dust, depending on how much dust is deposited, efficiency of the solar cell can be reduced. Short circuit current and um, uh, power, and uh, that will reduce uh, transmittance of glass. So, this is important problem. And also, uh, there was another idea, rather than texturizing the surface of glass, let's deposit on top of it nanoparticles, okay? If uh, you, you can see in this picture, very nice closely packed nanoparticles, but if we consider it within 100 nanometer scale, even within 100 nanometer scale, one can see this type of hole, and this type of hole, dust particle can come into it and just stay there, it will be not so easy to take it away. If this is happening in 100 nanometer scale, can you imagine uh, how much of dust particles could just stay there very well in one meter by one meter uh, on a large scale? So this uh, deposition of nanoparticles will probably on glass uh, that is not going to work as well. Yes, and also another problem is uh, on building integrated photovoltaics when the PV technology is installed on the roof uh, there will be, for example, another important issue. Since uh, no human is not here, this is a lovely place, Sodom and Homeray for birds. And there will be bird droppings that will create shadow. So then uh, developing anti-soiling coating, uh, coatings uh, suddenly becomes an issue uh, in this case. And also, uh, and nowadays there is tendency to develop such anti-soiling coatings from uh, hybrid materials or polymers. But when birds are sitting there, they can just scratch with both polymers and the hybrid materials. They are not mechanically strong enough. So then uh, developing mechanically very strong and uh, anti-scratch uh, coatings, uh, this is suddenly uh, becoming a very interesting issue. So this is the um, uh, main content of my talk. Thanks for attention, and uh, you are welcome uh, to ask your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Smago, for your wonderful presentation. So there is a question. Mm -hmm. What are the factors that affect solar panels efficiency? What are the factors that affect solar panels' efficiency? Yes, uh, so uh, temperature plays a big role, and uh, then environmental factor plays a role, and uh, uh, efficiency uh, and uh, intensity of sunlight is uh, playing a role. Um, yes. Um, okay, doctor. Then... Mm -hmm. Ma'am, how... Question. Yes, yes. Uh, shall I ask? Yes, Annie, you can ask. 
uh, yes ma'am uh, so uh, so uh, out when we uh, uh, bring sonar so, solar panels in india and uh, make our country uh, more easier for electricity using solar panels sir uh, i i didn't understand can you please repeat it uh, and sir, i heard about applications in india yes uh so uh so using solar panels how to make our country free uh from the electricity charges and uh, using solar panels we can easy for uh, electricity in india oh okay so i think um, it can be done uh, this is um, um important question and uh, it's uh, already implemented in many places uh, i believe in india also in some places it's implemented in africa for example uh, my student uh, he visited uh, south africa for one year and uh, uh, they brought uh, several pv modules uh, into one city uh, in that city there is no electricity and uh, so what can happen is that they have mobile phones uh, but uh, they will be just uh, discharged quickly and they open it a small company and that company uh, have pv modules in the daytime uh, the solar energy will be charging the uh, uh, mobile phones so there will be queue and the, and the yeah uh, people comes and they charge their uh, mobile phones and they're going again otherwise uh, they have to travel to 10 km to near a city where electricity is available i think uh, this is uh, uh, yeah a uh, good way so more questions thank you sir thank you andy uh, dr smagel there is another question for you okay. depending depending upon the solar modules does the efficiency of the solar cell changes depending yes, upon changes. the solar modules yes yes it changes it depends on uh, on the solar cell generation and on solar cell type. Uh, silicon uh, is a high efficiency uh, solar cell to today, which is durable. And uh, but the CIGS, for example, is better. Uh, CIGS, it's uh, when its module is done, uh, its efficiency is high. And uh, also, technology of preparation is uh, cheap. However, one deficiency in that is that indium is there. Without indium, high efficiency cannot be obtained. Cadmium telluride is also good. Just there are also issues. Uh, tellurium is uh, another uh, uh, rare earth. Uh, it's a very rare element. Luckily, there are not much customers at present that is interested to use tellurium, uh, but uh, uh, still, uh, tellurium is here a problem, except cadmium, of course. Cadmium is poison, so each of the solar cell have their own advantage and deficiency. But in terms of efficiency, uh, multi-junction cells, uh, solar cells and modules have very high efficiency to today. Uh, but the point is uh, technology uh, for fabrication of such cells and modules is very expensive. 250 US dollars per watt, this is super expensive. One should reduce it. Of course, uh, once uh, they will be used in cosmic technology, in cosmic space, nobody cares about the uh, price per watt. But uh, for terrestrial, uh, yes, uh, it can be issue. And uh, also disensitized solar cells, so simple to prepare that uh, type of solar cell. However, its durability is too limited, unfortunately. But um, durability one day can be solved. If uh, it's solved, then of course, uh, it will become a really popular type of uh, solar cells. Okay, doctor. Mm -hmm. Another question, Doctor. Uh -huh. Does graphene make a place in solar cells? Graphene? Yes, yes. Uh, graphene is uh, used in some types of solar cells, in uh, perovskite solar cells, for example. In silicon, I, uh, uh, I have seen some usages, uh, but um, 
uh, there is problem uh, about using graphene in silicon-based solar cells. But the graphene is used in, uh, in photoelectrochemical solar cells. And as uh, 2D materials, transition metal carbides, graphene oxide, and the modification of graphene oxide with um, silver and the gold nanoparticles. And uh, yeah, there is ongoing research work on that. And uh, applications in energy storage devices, for example. Okay, doctor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Since there are no more questions, shall we wind up this session, doctor? Yes, please. Jasmine, you can wind up. Thanks yes, so much, uh, Dr. Smother, for being with us. Uh -huh. Thank you, doctor, for your informative and uh, interesting session on photovoltaic technologies and its applications. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Please try again. It's a very great pleasure to me. Thank you so much, doctor. Mm -hmm. That was a very informative session. May I now request Sister Bridget Teladurai to welcome our next speaker, Reverend Father Dr. Killian, to share his insights on the conscious and the unconscious existence of the need for disciplinary, transdisciplinary research. Good afternoon, everyone. The management of Holy Cross College and Strive team take pride in having Reverend Dr. Killian Nigiti for this International Virtual Conference on TRICE 21. I deem it a great privilege in introducing the esteemed resource person, Reverend Dr. Killian Nigiti, Professor of Psychology, Salishan Pontifical University, Rome, Italy, to the galaxy of intellectuals connected through the Google platform online. The renowned speaker will address on the conscious and the unconscious existence of the need for transdisciplinary research. He has obtained his first degree to doctoral degree from the Salesian Pontifical University of Rome, has been in the field of formation since 1998. He is working in the areas of vocation discernment, pedagogy of formation, leadership qualities, and the conscious and unconscious motives that can condition human behavior. Presently, Father is teaching in the Pontifical University. Being psychopedagogist, he teaches materials related to psychology and pedagogy. He is also one of the general counselors of the Capuchin Order and working in the area of formation at the gender level. Dear Father Killian, we are indeed delighted to have you with us. We kindly request you to take over the session. Your microphone is uh switched off uh, father can you switch on your microphone we are not able to hear it's not audible hello not father yet. not yet your microphone is still not working Hello, Father.
something else that I want to huh. share the screen, but he's doing something else. Hello, Father. Hello. Uh, we can't hear you. Can you, uh, Father, can you just remove that uh, earphones and speak without the earphones, Father? Yeah, from the system also? Ah, uh, yes. If you can remove the earphones from the system also? You have to remove the earphones from the uh, laptop. Are you connected with your phone? Hello. Yes, Father. Hello? Now it's audible. Now it's audible. Oh, wonderful. Okay. okay. All right. Let, let, let me try to share my, my screen. Yes. Mm. Oh. Just click that upward arrow, which says present yeah. now, and then you can share your screen. The upward arrow in the bottom of your system. Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh. Uh, there, just a moment. Uh. Oh, there is a uh... There is an upward arrow near a hand symbol at the bottom of your screen. Yeah, is there an I see. Upward? Yeah, that one I'm you, seeing. But uh, just, the, just press the, that, and you will yeah. have present now. That's the mode that comes. You did it a few minutes back. Yeah, I did it a few minutes back, but then. Uh, uh when i when i start now they tell me you are already inside let me try again this way it, the the one that is next to that there is a hand symbol you have pressed that click the one that is next to that hand symbol the upward arrow yeah yeah and See, then you say share now okay since it is not like coming, I, I maybe I just go ahead and then I try I try again to enter. It is telling me that uh, yeah, please, I am trying that, but it doesn't like go. So let us just go ahead and then uh, I will try to 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 give you the the slide. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm, I'm happy to be with you. Connecting here from Rome, we want to share our contribution concerning the the conscious and the unconscious existence for the need for transdisciplinary research that is the the area we choose to intervene on and uh, i started by uh, presenting the objectives of the paper which is to acquire a succinct understanding of transdisciplinary research and its distinction from other disciplines. That is how this one can differ from the other disciplines. And to understand the ultimate goal of man on earth, what is man supposed to do on earth, and how she or he can realize that ultimate goal for which he exists. Then the nature of man and the virtues, the qualities that go in line with the ontological and the anthropological aspects. Man as a social being and elements that enhance collaboration like humility, respect for others, etc. 
the understanding of the present world and the unity of knowledge, the fact that knowledge is a unity, and uh, a more complete vision of the world. So we will be uh, trying to, at the end of the few minutes we have, we hope to help you to understand that there are needs for uh, this type of discipline, transitional research, and some of these needs are very visible. Some of them, unconsciously, we are not aware that we need to go above the single disciplines to look at the reality as a whole from above. So understanding some basic words, the term transdisciplinary research has evolved from the first step to overcome the interdisciplinary by the meaning given by Jean Piaget, which was about 50 years ago, and uh, to some type of a concept like a holistic, a holistic approach to the real world that is uh, where we live. So transdisciplinary research concerns, as indicated in the prefix trans, that which is above and goes across any other discipline. And this then favors the ultimate uh, goal for which we exist, for which the human being exists in the planet. That said, I have something here I'm going to rush over because the other speaker, you know, Regina explained already some of the, the, the concept, but then I will send to you the material. Here I was trying to talk about monodisciplinary research and monos, which means one, this is an approach which takes into consideration just one area of knowledge, develops it, has its own methodology, and someone specializes in this discipline. So it is just one discipline, one area, like someone specializing in the eyes or someone specializing in chemistry or in biology or in forestry, mono just an area of the world is touched. Then there is multidisciplinary research, uh, which involves scientists from a variety of different disciplines working together at some point in the research process, but with each approaching the issue at hand through that scientist's own disciplinary lens. Scientists might work on the same broad project, but they formulate and address separate research questions, usually coming to separate conclusions that can be disseminated through their own individual disciplinary journals. Then there is interdisciplinary research. This approach have the goal of transferring knowledge from one discipline to another and may in fact result in the creation of an entire new discipline such as biopsychology or health economics. So this one is when system and areas begin to interact among themselves and form a union. So one discipline can share its advantages with another discipline for the good of the whole, you know, and in doing that, sometimes we see the need, scientists see the need to create new disciplines in this regard. So there is a very close similarity to transdisciplinary research. So inter is when they come together. Now I try to put it here uh, on the diagram form there is disciplinary, monodisciplinary, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and transdisciplinary. It's a pity that you can't like see the, the, the graph. I will try that later. So when we talk about the transdisciplinary research, we are talking about the possibility, the science we tries to understand the goal of man, about his happiness, about what he or she needs, to live well in this world and goes above any single discipline or any interdisciplinary discipline 
in order to verify whether the goal, the goal of man on earth is being realized or not. So it is a type of lens which uh, gathers from all, but with the objective of helping the, the human being to be happy and to uh, uh, live well on earth. So it will go beyond health, you know, uh, uh, climatic conditions, economy, money, prayer, and all the other disciplines so as to understand the human being. So that said, we uh, want to talk about the consciousness. Consciousness then, it means you send a child to school, you want the child to come up and do something. Now we are here in the area of transdisciplinary research. Children in school do not learn isolated discipline just in isolation. They need to begin to learn to connect ideas. Ideas that they learn in chemistry, they connect it and see how it is useful in biology and in physics. And the ideas they learn in statistics and the practical life. So there is the conscious need then for teachers to understand that knowledge is one and we are talking about the whole the whole person so the child that is learning the person doing research is aware that there is need to see things not from their individual sectors which is in the surface good but from the whole so here we are talking then about what are those conscious needs for transdisciplinary research. So there is the need to develop thinking out of the box and creativity. Thinking out of the box so as to create creativity. There are traditional ways of thinking and when the knowledge or teachers or curriculums in school are prepared with this in mind, uh, children are taught how to think widely and uh, to experiment and to bring their knowledge for use. So the modern education system fosters convergent thinking, convergent thinking, which means applying a fixed set of rules to arrive to a single solution to the problem. On the other hand, thinking out of the box is a more free flowing process, free flowing process leading to several creative solutions to a single problem. Both divergent and convergent thinking are important, but encouraging only the latter can lead to a loss of creativity and critical thinking, which are the essential skills in our world. So uh, uh, modern people coming and living in a modern world and born in a digital society may have lots of insight that traditional education, educational system didn't think about. Researchers see more meaning in the way they learn. So with the transdisciplinary research and uh, teaching methodologies, those who are in the field, they see a more meaning to what is going on, even children. So many students, researchers, learn because they are told so by their organizations, schools, and their parents. The transdisciplinary approach connects one topic to many other subjects, allowing students and researchers to understand the topic much deeper, see the connectedness, and realize why they are learning about it or doing a particular research. This system also makes it easier for them to remember what they learn and make the necessary connections. Now, they, uh, uh, when students go to school or when researchers are in the field, you know, they want to, by force, want to make connections with their experience and with the knowledge they acquired already from different areas. Researchers are consciously motivated. Now, one of the very big things about students and researchers is that there must be that enthusiasm. 
the enthusiasm to go ahead and uh, to uh, and to learn. Now, connecting a topic to various subjects requires a certain level of creativity from the teacher or from the research manager. It makes the lesson or the research more engaging, more engaging, and uh, as our experience shows, creates curiosity and motivation in students and researchers to discover one topic from different and sometimes even unexpected angles. Okay, when they are motivated and we know the world is changing, maybe what the research director or the teacher thought he or she knew can then be challenged and improved upon when students or researchers are motivated to think out of the box and with their own experience of the world around them. Students learn a language of the specific problem. So we are saying that uh, transdisciplinary research learning encourages researchers and students to look at one problem under various angles. Students and researchers, they look at one problem from different angles. They have the light of different areas. They learn the versatile nature of a real life situation. Develop critical thinking and understand that there is usually more than one way and more than one right solution to a single problem. This kind of thinking is very appreciated and sought after by many headhunters these days. Now, uh, uh, for those who are listening, sometimes you can ask yourself whether people are actually thinking. It's like being specialized in one area and remaining stuck in that area. And it's like the whole world depends on that knowledge. Now, critical thinking, critical thinking and connectedness means that we allow what we have learned to influence us and we put the objectives of our life. Well, that's the concept. We put the objectives of why we live or what we want to gain after school, after studying and getting diplomas and doctorate and things. What do we want to gain? How do we want to, the society to be? How do we want to live in the society? That critical thinking and connectedness then becomes very easy when we get engaged in transdisciplinary research. Researchers build up confidence. Transdisciplinary approach encourages researchers to speak up their opinion in the field, even though it might be wrong. It helps researchers build up confidence and talk more easily, talk more easily without being afraid of punishment or being radical with bad grace or with paid judgment because you are free to express yourself. So it builds confidence. You know, when um, I listened to the speaker yesterday, uh, Dr. Regime from Ghana, he was talking about the difficulties of specialized discipline researchers to engage in interdisciplinary conferences and exchange of ideas because when i remain in my own discipline i'm very comfortable so when i have to leave my own discipline and listen to the other person and leave my own method of doing research in a particular discipline and uh, open myself up to see what the other person discipline can offer so that together we can go to a different level because we are talking here about transdisciplinary approach which means it must go above my own single discipline and above your own single discipline so as uh, to arrive at a new level 
that new level must be arranged arranged at before so we must know where we want our society to go if we don't know where we want to go and we don't have a goal that we want to realize in a society transdisciplinary research does not help us because we must be looking at whether research research centers in different areas and different sectors are helping us to become more loving and happy human beings inhabiting the earth we need to check that out if not then transdisciplinary research approaches will not be able to realize its goal now that said we are uh, we try to look at some of the things that very often are, on, are hidden it is not as if to say we become conscious that our existence in the planet earth is supposed to be a happy existence and that happy existence means that i need food to be able to uh, 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 to live i need to do sport i need moment for myself which is a silent moment i need friends and other needs so all those needs they come together and they help me to be a happy human being on planet earth it is true that with all these many needs we may go back to abraham maslow with all these many needs sometimes we can capitalize on one like you need to sleep a lot you need to drink a lot of water or you need to to do sport you need to eat this food and not that now we may forget that we have all of these needs that are necessary in a good proportion to be able to have a human being that is inhabiting the earth and who is happy so now we understand why there are unconscious because we fight and we work as if to say one area was a totality we are looking as a whole I look at the total human being from different different angles and when that is put in place then the society will change so i said here in the first place we are saying that a human being is a whole is a totality he or she is not only a physical being or a spiritual being a social being or with economic needs. He is also a rational being. A rational being means he is capable of drawing conclusions and projecting the future. A human being needs food and in good proportion, physical exercises, sleep, friends, security and silence, etc. So one spe specialist cannot satisfy a human being. I think that's clear enough that there is surely an unconscious need for transdisciplinary research and renovation if we project a future that is good, if we want to form people that will be able to uh, enjoy the society tomorrow. So we cannot like neglect that. Now, we need to take into consideration that the, the society, we are, we are talking about the unconscious needs for transitional research. The society is very complex. We live in a postmodern world. In a very complex society, we don't have to pretend that the tradition and the way of doing things that were very valid a few years ago, we continue to remain there and we'll be able to satisfy the needs of, the, of a human being who is growing in a fast, globalized, changing society. No, no. We need to be aware of that. If that is true, that society is complex, and that individuals in this world now may be more complex and have different needs and different difficulties and problems than those some years ago, and they might be very fragile, 
very fragile because of the environment we are living in, then we need to enhance, you see? So this becomes a very big need for transdisciplinary research so as to address the fragility of the society. 30 years ago, maybe our parents, they used to support a lot of difficulties and they were happy and they could support and remain in a specific vocation for long or a specific job till death. In a complex world with the need for change and change is very fast, if we don't engage in this type of research, we will be left behind. So we wrote here that the complex and individualistic nature of things, a lot of specialization in different areas, the holistic transdisciplinary approach provides a comprehensive perspective on life. We has as its support the problematic questions, the heuristic and research, the research, the insight into various levels of knowledge and reality as a link between abstract and concrete dimensions of experience. So we cannot we cannot like uh, just satisfy ourselves without thinking of the whole and seeing the difference between theory, theoretical knowledge and practical knowledge and real knowledge. So very often, specialists in different domains are very much gifted. And our children in education, in schools, may also be very much gifted intellectually that means being capable of acquiring knowledge in different fields, but that knowledge becomes, you know, uh, divided from the real life. So with transdisciplinary research, we are seeing how knowledge, abstract knowledge can be correlated with existing reality and real living. So the passage from, uh, uh, you know, uh, intellectual ascent of knowledge to real ascent. So you, not only the notions, abstract, but the real thing. You understand it, you meditate it in the heart, and behavior is conditioned by the knowledge that the students and the researchers are bringing forth in society. So we need to be aware that that society, the society in which we live in, is asking us to do that. This need is unconscious. So that doing this research and this program as the sisters have beautifully organized it, we may become conscious of this need. There is also a specific methodology. The transdisciplinary methodology is a way to facilitate referral an understanding of the relationship between the laws of nature and the human ones, between the humanistic and uh, the exact science, <clears throat> between people, different people, between different cultures, between different faiths, Muslim, Buddhist, Christians, uh, unbelievers, which emphasizes the incompatibility with the mere acquisition of knowledge, but the transfers and flexibility of thinking is in making relevant choices and rigor in finding solutions to the problems of life, which in turn are just transdisciplinary. So when we are looking for uh, solutions to problems of life, we are not concerned with whether you believe in God in this way or that. We are looking at the human needs of man. And therefore, we must go beyond faith. We must go beyond culture. We must go beyond places of origin. So that together we say, a living human being needs that. The way the human being we express that belief will be different according to the faith understanding and the faith enhanced push, which will make someone concentrate on this area than that. 
but those alone must be dealt with. Through the transdisciplinary methodology, the student or the researcher, the human, the human being is being understood as a whole and is thus addressed consequently without a reduction to unfavorable and unproductive fragmentation. So we are not uh, asking people to get specialized in one area. No, we are asking people to climb to that level where we can then see things together. Uh, one thing here which is very important, I put in the objectives of this course, but I will not be dwelling with that much because uh, mm, other speakers spoke about them, so we will leave that. Uh, the type of virtues that we need for transdisciplinary research, you know, the humility, the ability for collaboration, the need to understand researchers and teachers that they are not the masters of knowledge because knowledge is above us and we all have it. And we have it in different areas. So that I must be humble enough to learn from you a researcher in natural sciences and to learn from you someone, a guru in spiritual uh, area. And together we will produce something that is good for humanity and not fragmented knowledge. When I begin to think that psychology is the only thing that is necessary for human beings because human beings have problems. No, that presumption must be dropped. And I must be then humble so that people criticize the way I see things and together we push on. So that is the, uh, that methodology for uh, transdisciplinary research is important that each individual in his own field of specialization becomes humble, becomes simple, begin to think about others, begin to realize that he, is not the, he or she is not the author of knowledge for the good of our society. There is a link with life at all levels when we engage in transdisciplinary research. So there's a link. Since the objective of trans above is there, if we start with curriculums, curriculums that we make children use their household experiences and link those experiences to the new theories that are taught in school, then knowledge becomes very easy. So researchers are becoming more aware of the importance of the visible and the less visible links between areas of knowledge. We give them greater certainty in reporting to the world around, sustained by the increasing expertise in such an approach to life. Basically, researchers, students learn how to learn productively. So with this method, transdisciplinary uh, research approach, renovation, people learn to do things in a more productive way. They learn productivity because knowledge is being connected and they learn to live better in a society of tomorrow because they begin to understand that this is my view and my view needs to be challenged by some other person so that together we can live as a whole. A lot of difficulties we find in the educational sector, even in universities and big research centers, is that certain professors think that they are the almighty God in their area. They cannot understand that other people have other views which may be more uh, important and more acceptable than their own. That is the trouble. So there is need, if there's need for productivity, we need to understand that this way, this approach needs to be taken higher than what we are doing here and curriculums in secondary schools and in universities uh, learn to insert this 
that we do not just learn things in isolation. So uh, a holistic approach to the curriculum which involves freedom, autonomy and creativity in the curricular decision, that is from the part of the teacher, results in a holistic way of life, which means a higher level of understanding and an effective management of their own lives. So things are understood in a more higher way and life is managed in a better way. I'm going towards the conclusion. Therefore, transdisciplinary research is a way to increase the attractiveness, to increase the attractiveness of researchers and students towards learning and towards school in general. And it is focused on the promotion and the internalization of the authentic values and development of positive attitudes towards life. So that said, we are uh, uh, round up by like saying, there is need for everyone to understand the reason for life. We are given life by God, those who believe in God, or by nature or whatever you want to believe, but this life has a goal. For us to realize this goal, we need to look at life from different angles. So we privileging and talking about the needs and the advantages of transdisciplinary research does not mean that we are undermining monodisciplinary, multidisciplinary, or interdisciplinary researches. No, we don't undermine that. We need the division so that people may have real and deep knowledge on different angles. So that when people with real knowledge, specialized knowledge on different angles, different areas, different sectors of the world, they come with that vision of the society they want to build tomorrow, then they will be able to come out with and help people to grow with that connectedness and with that wholeness, not with fragmented knowledge and with blind knowledge. So that said, I will uh, allow you and I will try to send to uh, the sister the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the slides so that... Uh, they can pass it to you. So thank you very much, sisters, and thank you very much, participants, for... Uh, I will wait for the questions. Thank you, Father, for your wonderful presentation. Um, Father, there is a question. Yeah. Uh, uh, from your experience, which do you think is superior competence based on reason or competent based on mind to engage in transdisciplinary research? Yeah, uh, from what I, I understand, there is the need for experience because as rational beings, that's one of the things we know, as rational beings, we gain knowledge easily depending on our experience. So any new knowledge that we want to acquire, we want to relate that. If that knowledge is going to remain and help us, we want to, to relate that to our own experience that we have had in life. And therefore, uh, our personal experience experiences are very much important if we have to go ahead to arrive at a transdisciplinary uh, way approach because here we are engaged in uh, assisting uh, teachers, researchers, and students to see the need for this, for this way of learning and of approaching life. So experience then becomes more important. I don't know if that uh, is helpful, Sister. Yes, Father, thank you. So we have come to the end of our session. So yes, dear Father, with great sense of gratitude, I thank you for your excellent presentation on the topic, the conscious and the unconscious existence of the need for transdisciplinary research. You had indeed ignited the minds of the researchers 
I am sure that the researchers would have been benefited to find brilliant ideas from your expertise. Thank you once again for spending your valuable time with us amidst your busy schedule. So thank you, Father. Uh, you're welcome, sister. And thank everybody for, for listening. Okay. As we have come to the close of the three-day international conference, I would like to thank and acknowledge the hands and minds behind the success of this event. On behalf of the management of Holy Cross College and the organizing committee of the International Conference on Transdisciplinary Research and Innovation for Entrepreneurship and Sustainability, I am here to thankfully remember and acknowledge the persons who traveled with us in this journey. I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. Psalms chapter 9, verse 1. First of all, I give thanks to the Almighty Father for his guiding presence and blessings throughout this conference. I accord my sincere thanks to all the speakers, Professor Greg Foliante, University of Melbourne, Australia, Dr. Christopher Abraham from the SP Jain School of Global Management, Dubai, Professor Sudesh Kumar from the University of Malaysia, Professor N. Rajendran from Yelagapai University, Dr. Vijay Shankar, Charles University of Technology, Sweden, Mr. Simon Burkett from London, Dr. Asma Bhumbi from Hungary, Professor Sendil from Tamil Nadu, Dr. Kabali Subramanian, VIT University, Oman, Dr. Lajwante Kishnani, Amitti University, Dubai, Dr. Selvakumar Pichaya from the Norway University of Applied Sciences, Dr. Selvakumar, sorry, Dr. Jocelyn Chikwada from the Zimbabwe Open University, Dr. Reginald Hama from Africa, Dr. David Wilson from the University of Melbourne, Dr. Marco from Serbia, Dr. Parvez Alam from the Crescent Institute of Science and Technology, Chennai, Dr. Marco from Serbia, Dr. Monica Gallant from Canada, Dr. Smuggle from Norway, and Father Killian from Rome for grazing this occasion with their virtual connections and collaborations. All the sessions were able to enlighten the participants with a focus on transdisciplinary research, channeling towards innovation, entrepreneurship, and sustainable development. Thank you all for the versatile and experiential sharing. I wholeheartedly thank our beloved secretary, Reverend Sister Dr. Annie Xavier, and our supportive principal, Reverend Sister Dr. Christina Bridget, who are always with us as a source of motivation in all our endeavors. Thank you, sisters. I also thank our vice principals, deans, and heads of various departments for their presence, support, and cooperation. My sincere thanks to all the virtual delegates of the conference from India and abroad for their participation and willingness to share their knowledge with us. On this occasion, I gratefully acknowledge the organizing members, Dr. Sheila Christopher, the Stride Project Coordinator for Holy Cross College, and Dr. Presenta Shakila Mota, Stride Project Co Coordinator, and Assistant Professor PG and Research Department of Rehabilitation Science for their untiring efforts in the successful organization and conduct of the conference. Thank you, dear teachers. Unity is strength. The strength of this venture is from the faculty representatives of the various departments who are committed and always ready to walk an extra mile, work an extra time for the greater glory of the Institute, making the Stride Project Component 1 viable in this campus. I thank all the staff members from the various departments who, by being moderators and technical supporters, have made this virtual conference happen in these abnormal times of pandemic. The works of our hands got its life with the support of our administrative faculty, technical staff, and the media host team. I thank each one of them individually for their contribution in the success of this conference. My sincere thanks to all the media and press personnel for taking this event to a greater audience. My special thanks to all the student participants and the research scholars who participated in large numbers to make this event happen. Thank you, dear students. Once again, I thank everyone who has contributed to the success of this conference in their own way. 
once you live your life for another for a moment you turn a real human so let us all continue our journey in making better changes in the lives of the people we meet thank you one and all participants kindly fill in the feedback link which is posted in the chat box